Today, we are deciding if 2023 is the best year for games ever, is it? We're almost done with the year. People have been saying this is the best year perhaps ever. So we are going to dig into that, the history of games. Yes. We have eight options we're gonna be analyzing in depth to find out which was actually the best. Yeah, and we have the legendary producer of the Ace Attorney series, one of my favorite series of all time. He was able to answer some questions from our Patreon community, which is super exciting. And we finally have his answers back. Find out the, the big questions are answered ladder or step ladder. I know you wanna know, I wanna know too. We're gonna read those answers out loud. How, I wanna know, how did, how did you swing this? You've been working in secret on this, you've been excluding me, you've not been telling nope. me what's been going on. What, what, what is this and how did this happen? I am very mysterious in many ways. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we are, you know, we have great relationships with our good friends over at Capcom. They are wonderful to us and we get to do so many cool things. I think that they know that we have a very big Ace Attorney fan base in the Kit and Krista community. That is true. Headed by their queen, of course, me. Um, <laughs> I was like, who is it? <laughs> um, actually, I think it might be Jay Rando. Anyways, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome that they are giving us the opportunity to let our community ask um, the producer of the series questions. They, our, our community came out swinging with some great questions. Some of them are, are really funny and humor. Some of them are very serious. Um, and uh, the producer took it in all in good stride and, and gave some really great answers. So I can't wait to share that with everybody. Oh, well, that's cool. I'll be taking notes. Maybe I'll learn a thing, a or, thing two. or two. Yeah. I know, right? You are you're you're a little you're a little dumb sometimes. I'm dumb. <laughs> you're a little dumb. <laughs> it's, not it's, my okay. Fault. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We we do not um, we don't blame you for your 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 occasional dumbness. Okay. Okay. Um, speaking of our wonderful community, everything that we do on this channel is made possible by our wonderful Patreon community. As you can see, we do a lot of cool things with our community. They get cool opportunities like getting to ask, ask the producer of Ace Attorney series questions, but they also get some cool stuff from us too. They get lots of bonus content, including bonus Q and A's, early access. We are gearing up for our final meetup of the year, which is so exciting. I can't wait. Two days after Christmas. Two days after Christmas. It's gonna be really fun. But yeah, if you'd like to support us, we are at patreon.com slash kit and Krista. Indeed. We got some fun stuff going on. This is our last couple days in the quote office. Oh, the office. Before we take a little break for yeah. the holidays. But we have a lot going on. But Tomorrow <laughs> is Tomorrow? our very exciting, very big uh, Kit and Krista Never a Minute Mega Corp holiday party. Yay! And we're vlogging this. We are. This is going to be our next Super Kit and Krista 64. We are. we are vlogging our holiday party. And perhaps more excitingly, we have a big stack of presents. We just keep be bringing presents in for each other, which hey, is you, like a little crazy. We pulled up at the same time. You got out of your car and you had a stack of presents. And then you got out of your you, car. You thought I was done. I, I had, thought you were done. I had one more. You got one more. That I added to the pile. So this is this is quite a, kind of a uh, prodigious stack of presents. Oh my gosh. So in that episode, you can watch our holiday party. We're going to Benihana, which I love, mm -hmm. my favorite restaurant in the world. Yes. And then we'll be opening up all those presents. What could they be? I'm so excited. What could they be? Some of mine are a little controversial. More Steam decks? What do you mean by that? You've been, you, you keep saying know. that. I feel like you're this, managing my expectations. There's one president in there that you're was it like a going jar to. Jar of mayonnaise? Or like, what are we talking about here? Why would I do that? I don't know. I made a, I made a mayonnaise sculpture of you. <laughs> I, did, I have seen those at the grocery store like now. Butter, 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 what is this? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> have you seen the, um, the cheese sculpture fondue thing? Okay, no. it's kind of cool. Uh -huh. And then you melt the statue and you can font, oh. you can like font, you, you dip the thing in the cheese. Okay, no, I've not seen this. I feel like it's kind of cool. Like okay. if someone wanted a cheese fondue statue with me, I would be down for that. Anyways, um, yes, we got, we got presents. We, we are, we are into gift giving, I yes. feel. Like both of us. We're into like Christmas. Gifts. We're into in, Christmas in general. In general. In like our way. studio is yes. very decorated. But then we also really like giving, I like giving gifts a lot. A lot. Like, I really like giving people yeah. presents. Yeah. Anyway, so that's going to be really fun, and I can't wait to see what you think of your gifts. Again, one of them is controversial, so y'all will have the, the, the experience, too, of your reaction. Watch me rage, rage quit and Christmas. Like, I'm out. Throw it out the window, like, <laughs> <"Arr!"> <laughs> 
Um, we, as we wrap up 2023 and move into 2024, we're just doing a little look back, look forward of the things. Um, we are going to be doing a video on our top 23 Switch games of 2023, which will be fun. And we have some of them in our you know Game of the Year podcast I was at last week. Yeah, but, you'll know what the top ones are. Yeah. But there's a lot more. Kind of in the middle-ish. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was it was crazy how quickly we came up with this list. I know. But well, at first we were like, let's not commit to a number. Right, it was like, well, maybe we'll do 10. Then maybe, maybe, no, maybe we can make it to 20. And then... It's just, and, <laughs> And then we got to 23 and we had to like take some we stuff some off. We had some omissions, yeah. And we're like, no, we got to take this off because yeah. we need to keep it like punchy at 23 right. games for right, 2023. Right, right. And then over the weekend, I was like, wait a second. If we're doing 23 games of 2023, we got to do most anticipated games of 2024. So then we're doing that too. You texted me at 8.30 on a Sunday, which is uh, uncharacteristic. I just woke up and I had a, I like dreamed up this... I had a dream about like we should do this. Cool. I don't think we know yet when this is going to come out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the before twenty twenty four, the list is good. The list is great. Yes. I am already. I, I couldn't believe how many games are are in Q one that you I I want panicked. slash need to play. Yeah, you like because panicked. I thought like we're getting out of this year and you know like we've been talking to some developers and they're like well we think next year might be better in terms of having more windows of the release. Yeah. So, well, I think Q one. Well, last year, I remember Q1 was a little empty, and then it started to, like, dump games, basically. Right. And then we were, like, in, like, a... By the time we got into Q2, we were, like, inundated. Right. This one, this feels a little opposite. Like, there's a lot coming out in Q1, but we, it's hard to see what... Well, there's stuff beyond. that's not announced yet. I mean, right. there might be a Switch 2. There might be all those games. There, we is. know there's going to be other games that get announced yeah. that are big, yeah. that are come out. So, it, it is very Q1 heavy, but... But yeah. I'm glad, though, because last year, Q1, we got suckered into playing Fire Emblem Engage because we were You're bored. just mad about that. <laughs> because we got bored, and I remember <laughs> literally nothing about that game. So now I'm glad that I have, like, I'm spoiled for choice in Q1. Because right. there's a lot of good stuff coming in Q1. And I'm excited to yeah. play them. So yeah. yeah. That's good. Now I don't feel like the need to, like, like you know, have to, have to like, play something right. that I wasn't super excited right. about. Well, before we get to 2024, we have to talk about 2023 and all the other years that came before it to decide which was the greatest game ever for games. But first, we will be shouting out our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Factor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Factor. This bustling holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, flavorful meals to fuel you on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You will save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. This weekend, I had the uh, annual phone call with my mother oh. about who's cooking what oh. for the big... Holiday Christmas dinner. Eve celebration. Yeah. We do it in it's traditional Swedish yes. uh, foods. I got my to-do list. My sister's coming. She's got her to-do list. Right. So what this means is I'm going to be very busy mm -hmm. in the days leading up to Christmas. And I will be doing Factor until then. Exactly. To make it easy on myself. Exactly. This is the perfect time to get your Factor going because I'm sure everybody is either attending a lot of holiday events or prepping for a lot of holiday events. The other thing is is that a lot of the food around the holiday is kind of unhealthy. Oh, that's a good point. So if you want to just kind of find a little bit of balance with your nutrition, Factor has such good options for that. And they're all dietitian approved and um, easy. You know, two minutes in the microwave. They're never frozen, they taste really good, and yeah, they're a great go-to right now while you're probably very, very busy with all your holiday plans. Yes, there are more than 35 meals available every week, and those change all the time, so you can always pick something that you like. Also, I say, do not do not sleep on the cold-pressed juices. We oh had a gosh. chance to try those out so recently. Good. Those are very good, mm -hmm. very refreshing, come in a wide variety we got green juices, we got other yeah. types of juices. Really fresh, really great. Really good. Yeah, yeah, totally. They have like quick breakfast items, on the go items as well. So again, for your busy schedule, it's perfect. Yes. So head to factormeals.com slash kitandkrista50 and use code kitandkrista50 to get 50% off. That's code kittenkrista50 at factormeals.com slash kittenkrista50 to get 50% off. We'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. All, All right. right. 
Big segment here is 2023, the best year for games ever. Ever. We will not let idle chatter like this pass without some analysis. We have to have a scientific people, people say, approach. People saying out of the corner of their mouth that the JW married after the Game Awards, <laughs> after 19 margaritas. <laughs> hey, maybe this was the greatest year ever. No! You have just spawned a, a long yeah. podcast segment for us. Exactly. So we have done some research and we now have eight different years mm -hmm. that we will be taking a close look at. Yeah. And we're going to find out which one we think was the best. And we also polled our Patreon subscribers and got a very interesting definitive answer. Answer. On what yes. people thought. And some great comments. Right. Too. Yeah. So let's start. We're going to go uh, earliest to latest. Yes, yes. And our earliest year is 1996. I do have to say. You weren't alive then? Just kidding. The older I get, I do feel lucky to have seen pretty much the entirety of this industry as we know it now. Yeah, like the golden age, as no, they say. No, I, I just mean all of it. Oh, you've seen all of it? Because it's like my first system was an, an, an NES. Okay. Actually, my, my family had an Atari, and I thought video games were awful because that Atari, mm. those Atari games were bad. The controller is pretty rough. Right. <laughs> so, like, I do recognize, like, there are people who, like, we hear this all the time. It's like, oh, my first system was the Wii, or my first system was the whatever. It's like, oh, child. It's like, well, you can go back and you can play all those games, mm. but, like, we lived through that. We did. It's a very lucky thing. It is true. And it, it, it is during your, quote, formative years right. when you had sort of cemented your love for video games. And it truly is a thing that if you hadn't lived through it, I don't think you would have changed your life in this way for, for us to both, you know, feel so deeply rooted in the industry because we grew up in this time and then now we we work in the industry so it's just like very very lucky very fortuitous for us yeah. but anyhow so, we're going back to 1996 so 96, though this is, just, this is just a smattering of what came out that year we have the nintendo 64 hardware came out yeah which means that, that mario 64 came out the first resident evil came out mm -hmm. so the playstation was on the scene uh, the original Diablo came out. I didn't realize the first Diablo was that old. It's pretty old. On PC. Yeah. The first Crash Bandicoot. Wow. And then interestingly, we do have these two very late SNES generation games, Donkey Kong Country 3 and Super Mario wow. RPG. So those are the representative games we have on 1996. Thoughts? This is such an interesting year for me personally because I had a very Nintendo-heavy gaming experience prior to 1996 and then for some reason in 1996 like i did not own a nintendo console what happened i don't know it's very strange like what happened you and became what they call a hater no not at all because i would play n64 at my friends houses all the time yeah and we played so much um like super mario 64 we were playing like a lot of these games so you're mooching I was a moocher, okay. like Goldeneye, like all that stuff. Yeah. I definitely mooched, but I didn't own one. Um, the other thing is, is that I think I started to start dabbling a bit more into like PC games around that time. So I remember, oh, really? I remember playing Diablo on PC. Wow. And okay. I think this is the year that I personally realized like there is more to games than just Nintendo, right. actually. And right. I was like, what? Yeah. And it sort of blew my mind a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... A lot of people say that this year is just like, just this in incredible sort of um, unreal experience for them because finally they see this like 3D world for Mario and it was like, wow. I don't know. I feel like I didn't have that wow moment for some reason because I, w I wasn't like, I wasn't like a Nintendo purist that time, at that time. I don't know. So I, I'm not like, I don't have strong feelings towards 96. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely an important year for the industry with Mario 64 just sort of kind of laying, laying down the law. Like, yeah. here's how you make a 3D platformer. Right. But, you know, there's no other N64 games on this list because that was such a barren year yeah, for the system. That's true. Again, I lived it. You lived it. And you there, had one. And, and you there was nothing. It. Yeah. <laughs> and it was rough. You played like Mario 64 for like yeah, six yeah. months. Basically. So I think the highs here are super high, but I don't think yeah. it was like as stacked just year round mm -hmm. as something like this year was. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of my definitive feeling on that. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, there's a lot of people who missed those late SNES games because they just moved on. I did. 
hands up right now because right. that Mario RPG, I did not play this game. I mean, yeah, um, I mean, that's what happens, and that's like so that's what we talk about with the Switch. You know, as you transition to Switch Two, like some people just stop caring about when once the new thing comes out. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's very true. So, kind of yeah. is what it is. Uh, next, we have ninety-seven. Just the next year, our representative games here are GoldenEye, oh, yeah. Castlevania Symphony of the Night, oh. Final Fantasy Seven, yeah, Mario Kart sixty-four, the original Fallout on PC, the original oh. Quake yep. on PC. Quake was Amazing on PC. Star Fox 64 and Tomb Raider 2. Wow. You were into Tomb Raider, didn't, didn't you say I that? I was into Tomb Raider. I was into Quake. I was into Final Fantasy 7. Did you play Fallout? Did I you did play? Not, I did not play original Fallout on PC, no. Did you? I played the first two Fallouts a little late. I didn't really dabble with PC gaming until I kind of got into college. Mm, yeah, and I picked up I picked up those games yeah. around then, so it was a little bit later on. Those are great games, though. Great uh, games. I mean, I think a lot of people only know Fallout from the the more recent mm -hmm. Bethesda games. Yeah, but, I mean, those are very much in the like classic Baldur's Gate, do anything. Kind of spirit. Yeah, your, your story can totally change, like that kind of thing. Right, kind of thing. right, yeah. right, right. I mean, here, you know, there, there's always like these years where these consoles are just like in full swing, and this is, you know, feeling like one of them, where right. finally the N64 has, has some great stuff. games. It's kind of making its mark, is this great multiplayer system. We have yeah. GoldenEye, Mario Kart, Star Fox 64 had a good multiplayer mode mm -hmm. as well, people might forget. And that's what I use that. Or, or what I was doing with that system with my friends. And I think that's why I was a moocher, because I did not see sort of this need for me to play any single player games on N64. So I was perfectly happy. And I was at my friend's house all the time anyway. We were always together anyway, playing these multiplayer games together. And then when I was, you know, at home, um, I was playing games like Final Fantasy VII, you know? Like, so I, I didn't have this need to, I think, by the system, I still, you know, so it was like very much for a specific purpose, which was really interesting because that wasn't my experience with Nintendo consoles before. And then also interestingly, you know, PlayStation starts to have some separation here with yeah. the franchises that had previously been Nintendo franchises. Yeah. So that, that hurts. You know, now they have Final Fantasy, now they have Castlevania, mm -hmm. and Castlevania is transformed into this totally different, amazing Metroid yeah. type game. So... Again, I, I, th this is not my pick for the best year ever, but th this was definitely a good one. This was a really good one. And again, this is definitely part of my formative years. And I think it's swaying my like love for this year because I do, I do have like a very core memory for Final Fantasy VII that I'm never going to forget. So you didn't have an N64, but you did have a PlayStation? I did have a PlayStation. I see. Yeah. I and then I get... spent a summer with my cousins who had only a PlayStation. We, they didn't have N64. And that was, that was when we started playing Final Fantasy VII. For like months, we played Final Fantasy VII. And I, I just saw this cousin... Um, a, a few months ago when I was in China, we literally saw each other and I was like, remember when we were playing Final Fantasy VII? And he's like, yeah, it was like the best. So even in, like, we're really old now. So for both of us to have this, like, such a core memory of this is so interesting. It, mean, it means something, you know? I didn't get, uh, when did I get my PlayStation? I think it may have been 98. Oh, okay. Was when I got the PlayStation. Got so yeah, yeah. In, the, in the moment... You know, that, that Final Fantasy, I was just not paying attention to mm -hmm. that Castlevania. I got that, you know, much later on in that yeah. generation. I eventually played it, but it's 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 not the same as feeling it play, or playing it in the moment. In the moment, yeah. Next we right. have nineteen ninety eight, and I swear we're not just going literally year by year. Yeah, the, we this, have a skip we have a skip. After this time is skip kind of a is time coming. Skip. But but this is one of the big <laughs> ones. Like when people talk about the best years ever, this yeah. is this is one of the ones that gets mentioned the most. So yeah. we have yeah. Metal Gear Solid, the first one. Wow. Half Life. Wow. The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, Fallout 2, Resident Evil 2, Starcraft, oh, yeah. Banjo-Kazooie, Grim Fandango. I love that game. Baldur's Gate, and the U.S. release of Pokemon Red and Blue. Mm-hmm. That's pretty stacked. Pretty, pretty stacked. Pretty stacked. Yeah. I mean, pretty this stacked. is really every platform at the top yeah. of its game. Yeah. PlayStation, N64, PC... It's just like no matter what you had, like mm -hmm. you you were eating good. 
I, I think I played a lot of PC games in this era. A lot, I remember. Yeah, this was like when I was really, again, getting more into PC games. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a ridiculously stacked year. There's so many games here that like, just like stood the test of time too, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, these games would still hold up really well. And like, it's crazy to see like Baldur's Gate here and then now like it won a game award, you know, in 2023. So it's like, yeah, these have lasting power because they were good in the beginning. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it is also this kind of evolution of 3D games where mm -hmm. Mario Kart, or excuse me, Super Mario 64 really showed how to make that transition and make yeah. something that was fun to play. But now you had Metal Gear and Zelda right. kind of showing something that I think for some people was like more elevated, where Metal Gear was this very cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. You had all the voice acting with the codec conversations. Yeah. And Kojimo was like, you know, really thinking about his camera angles and all of that. Yeah. And then... We talk about Ocarina of Time, too, like how it just totally feels ahead of its time. And after all of those different remakes, it still f plays, like, so well. And that's when you know. It's, like, at the core, this game was, like, so futuristic and really, like, took that 3D gameplay to the next level. So you can see it here. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these games... That, that's one lens to look at. Like, do these games still hold up? Yeah. I'd say Metal Gear, yes. Half-Life, yes. Ocarina of Time, yes. I mean, Resident Evil, they've remade Resident Evil 2. Mm -hmm. Banjo-Kazooie, oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, StarCraft is also, like, the kind Falling of... Falling off a little Kind bit, of the beginning of, yeah. of eSports. Yeah. And the whole, like conversation of like, hey, have you heard what's going on with StarCraft in Korea? Like we all had that conversation <laughs> yeah. and that was all interesting. And yeah. you know, that was really a precursor of, of things to come. And it's kind of, gosh, right. it's kind of sad to, to think about how that we make it. series has been bungled since. <laughs> I know. That's kind of a bummer. Let's go back to original StarCraft, please. But yeah, Half-Life yeah, I mean, to Half-Life. What a next level thing that is. You know? So, yeah, I really recognize that this was a super great year, and I absolutely enjoyed all these games. But again, I, for, for me, myself, I feel like there are still greater heights yeah. ahead. Same. Okay, time skip time. Okay, so we're moving up to 2001. Ooh. We have the release of, this was a hardware year, this GameCube is... hardware, Xbox hardware. Yeah. PS2 had come out the year before. Right. The original Halo, Grand Theft Auto 3, yep. Super Smash Brothers Melee, Metal Gear Solid 2, Devil May Cry, Final Fantasy X, Jack and Daxter, Silent Hill 2, wow. Luigi's Mansion, Max Payne, Sonic Adventure 2, Golden Sun, and Eco, just to name a couple. Wow. 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 I think this is actually a bit better than 1998 myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, anytime you can tack on hardware launches, that makes it all a bit more exciting. I yeah, feel. exactly. It marks the start of a new era, you know? And while this was a little bit, it wasn't as dramatic, you know, as N N SNES to N64, I still think that it was like this very unique, like the, the 2000s were just a unique time in like pop, culture as well and there was like you know that early 2000s vibe is totally felt across all of these things like it just has a very like specific feeling and if you were there during that time period you can see this play out not just in gaming but in like all of pop culture as well and it was funny and fun and different and like people were trying to be like you know cool and like <laughs> Nintendo was in its like like rebel era and it's it's kind of interesting to look back on something like that because it just felt so different from before. I mean this is really the start of that next generation, the first year yeah. of the PS2. Mm. Mm. Not all those games hold up super well. But I mean every everybody's representing here. I mean, you know, there's I think there's only one Xbox exclusive on this list, but it's the original Halo, which is like yeah. this legendary game. And we have Smash Melee, Luigi's Mansion. I mean, Grand Theft Auto 3 now is, like, introducing open-world games to all mm -hmm. these people in this new way. You know, whatever you think about it, more mature gaming. Yes, exactly. As well, which became just this thing that people were chasing 
you know, to this day. So, yeah, this is this is pretty great, I have to say. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing stuff. 2004, we have Halo 2, Half-Life 2, Metroid Prime 2. This is the year of 2s. <laughs> the year of 2s, yeah. Metal Gear Solid 3. Uh-huh. World of Warcraft coming off the top rope. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Star Wars KOTOR 2. Doom 3. Far Cry. Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. Dang! Ninja Gaiden. Metroid Zero Mission. And the original Fable. Wow. This was such a great year. Don't you think? This might be my pick, actually. I think this might be my... No, I can't decide well, right now. Well, so the reason... Again, everybody has reasons for picking these years. I... My, oh. my So this was my first year working out in of college industry? and working in the industry. Yeah. So I finally had a bit of money in my pocket, some wham. So you could, so I could buy, buy some stuff? I finally had all three consoles, which is something mm-hmm. I, I still maintain to this day. And I was just, I was like, I'm going to play everything. And I did. So, like, that that kind of was an important factor for me yeah. versus some of the previous years where it's like, oh, you know, I need mommy and daddy to, to buy this for me or, yeah. I, or I don't have that system. And, and then, like, now I'm in the industry and that's giving me all this different perspective and appreciation. And there was yeah. so much excitement around that. I can understand why people would pick a different year. But for me, like, this is this is pretty top on the list. I think this is the year where I realized games can be something different than, like, I don't know. Like, it, it could be more than just a game, I guess. This like is when it, you became cripplingly addicted to World of Warcraft. <laughs> games yes. can be a crippling addiction is what <laughs> <Yes>. you learned. <laughs> I learned that, yes. But it was, like, one of those things where I, I suddenly realized that, like, this is not just this, like, bit of entertainment that you can do on the side. It's it is a totally a social experience. Probably because I was playing World of Warcraft, I made like real friends. You know, I like learned like all the stuff was possible because of gaming. And it was weird. Like I just didn't realize that before then. Even though I was playing games with my friends, I just didn't realize this sort of other side of video games that made it so that I wanted to work in the industry. I was not working in the industry at the time, but like I just fell so deep in love with video games in that year that I was like, it would be a dream to, to be able to work, you know, in, in gaming. And I was lucky enough to, to do that. But yeah, I think that was, the, that was the year that I really realized that. It was like, this is more than just like some fun little thing that you do on the side. Like there's some real like impact life stuff that happens when you play these games um, that's really unique and special and something that I think not a lot of other industries have this kind of interactive relationship building experience that you can have. Like, yeah, that, that's that's when I realized it in 2004. And this is crazy to look at this list and, and see the, the, the games that made that me think that. Um, but yeah. One of the things that I'm seeing here is between 2001 and 2004, we got three Grand Theft Auto games, three all-time classic, incredible, massive <gasps> Grand Theft Auto games. And now it takes 10 years. <laughs> More than 10 years. It's like 12 years. How are we going to make it? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, no. The homies who don't make the it before Grand Theft Auto comes out. Pour one out. <laughs> um, I know. San Andreas was such a good game, too. Oh. I don't know how they did that. I don't know how they did that. In, too. in three years, I don't think they basically, they made three, three games of that size. They're all so different. I can't amazing. believe that. That's how? Amazing. That's amazing. So, all right. So that's kind of the farewell to that generation because our next is 2007, and, and by this point, Xbox 360, PS3, and we are all out there. We got right. we got Mario Galaxy, mm-hmm. the original. We got Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, which, if you don't know, that was the one that kind of made Call of Duty, Call of Duty, right? And what it is now, of course. The original Uncharted, Halo 3, Bioshock, wow. the original Assassin's Creed, which is kind of a bad game, but again, did, did set, did set establish the standard the franchise. for this franchise, yeah. The original Mass Effect, Guitar Hero 3, Portal, and Crisis. Wow. Wow. Very wow. impressive. Very impressive yeah. year. The, 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 the um, era of plastic instruments and plastic <laughs> then, accessor- well, accessories. I think we had maybe year. one more year after this before it all fell apart. It all fell apart. Yeah, but we really had fun yeah. with the plastic accessories we sure did. 
for the, the, that like three, four year mark yeah. or whatever it was. It was fun while it lasted. It was fun while it lasted. And then it was shoved into a yeah. closet. Shout and, out to Goodwill. And then I had <laughs> to like Salvation <laughs> Army my, my entire like library right, right, right. of guitars and, and drums and all sorts of that stuff. But what a, wow. Yeah, this again, this is another thing where it's like, okay. I mean, now, now there are these there are more connections to today, whereas yeah. some of these other series, like, oh, Halo, like, they're they're trying to, to hold on. Halo's good. And Metroid Prime, we've been waiting forever for that. Metal Gear Solid, basically over. But now, Call of Duty. Big still there. Then, big now. Assassin's Creed. Uh, yeah, still, still going, there? Str still still going strong. Mario Galaxy, <laughs> no. Nope. Well, I mean, Mar you know, Mario 3D Just games kidding. are always popular. Mario 3D games, yeah. Mass Effect. Uncharted, we got please, three of those. Please make more of those. So, um, yeah, no, it's true. It, it does feel like more of a direct link to today than maybe some of the others that feel more classic. And because we was on the scene, um, it was one of those things where like, it's not just a traditional controller. Now we have like a guitar that you can play and like this Wii remote that does all this random true, stuff. True, true, true. You can be a DJ and a drummer and a whatever. So it's like this really weird... And then right after this, we got like Toys to Life stuff. Like, it's like one of those things, it's like now we have all these like offshoots to what you think of a traditional video game. Obviously those, that, that trend has kind of come and gone, but it was like a moment in time where what we thought was a video game controller and what we thought playing a video game is like was totally turned on its head. So it's kind of interesting. I'm also too. realizing you don't have any uh, handheld games on this list, but the DS was, you know, going right. gangbusters here. Yeah, and, and touch screen was a thing. I'm, I'm sure and there were some great DS games in, in 07 too. Yeah. That I just forgot to add to the list. Yeah, yeah. Somehow now we time skip 10 years to 2017. What happened between 07 and, and 17? Who I don't can remember? I don't know. I don't. The Wii U. There's nothing notable about that. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> so, this is a big one. We have Nintendo Switch hardware. Who could forget? Mm -hmm. Which means we also get The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. We get Super Mario Odyssey. We get Splatoon 2. We have Persona 5. Fortnite Battle Royale. PUBG. Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn. Nier Automata. Wow. Resident Evil 7. Metroid Samus Returns. Sonic Mania, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Destiny 2, and Mario Kart 8 Dang. Deluxe. Stacked. Wow. Stacked. I forgot that Metroid Samus Returns came out after the Switch was released. Mm-hmm. What yeah. a weird thing that was. I was, I was convinced. I was like, okay, we're doing this 3DS version, but surely we're going to have a Switch version any day now, right? Well, they right? got Dread like years later. And I'm which still was, waiting. Like, kind of a thing. They should put it out, though. That would be oh, so you great. want that to be on Switch? Yes, okay. I, I really want that to be on Switch. That's I, such a good game. I can't, That's such a good I game. I can't believe we'll have gone this whole generation. They should have put that it. out before Dread came out, huh? Yes. Womp, womp. Dread was good, though. Um, and it was like a direct sequel. Yeah, they're both great. Yeah, but th this is this is the game that kind of set that style right, of right, Metroid right. games. So. so, you know, the big thing here is obviously the Switch, but also, you know, the first year for consoles is usually a little bit slow, and yeah, this, this was the one. complete opposite. Yeah, they learned their lesson. <laughs> it was perhaps one of the most stacked years ever for, a launch for, year, yeah. for the Switch. Yeah. In addition to all these other huge things that were happening, like, you know, the Battle Royale explosion with uh, Fortnite and PUBG. What happened to PUBG? PUBG really I don't know. went really poof, fell off. Yeah, poof. what happened? Um, but it was like that again. It, it marked another kind of thing, shift in like gaming as a different kind of experience with these yes. battle royale games. Right. Like this is another kind of like, hey, we're doing more than just playing the game. We're like really socializing and, and like instead of like hanging out like IRL, we're hanging out on like Fortnite. You know, that was a, a human societal shift that happened. That was really right. interesting. And, you know, I think perhaps maybe one of the reasons we don't have pre-2017 years is, you know, it was those dark days of Nintendo. So maybe those years just didn't feel, you know, a lot of these years, it's like everybody's doing great. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got great games. Yeah. Everybody's succeeding. And Nintendo was in the doldrums, and we were living those doldrums, which was a bummer. And this was the big comeback. So I think maybe that made it all feel all the more Grand. triumphant. Yes. That Nintendo was back. But then also like like Persona 5, um, 
you know, say what you will about uh, Sonic Mania. People love that game. Mm -hmm. Resident Near Evil 7. That was a Horizon? great... Horizon? Yeah, yeah, just... The, that first Horizon game was Chef's Kiss Amazing. Like... Well, maybe they shouldn't have launched it... They shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have done that announcement while. strategy. But that strategy. And then the like next the one, the same day as Elden Ring. Oops. Stop doing that. Oops. Why? Oops. <laughs> um, but the, the game was amazing. Like seriously, like just wow. What a first entry. Very, into that series. very, very incredible year. Yeah. And then we brings us to 2023. Yeah. Where we have Tears of the Kingdom, Baldur's Gate Three, mm -hmm. Spider Man Two, Alan Wake Two, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, Pikmin Four, the Resident Evil Four Remake. Final Fantasy 16, Street Fighter 6, Metroid Prime Remastered, the list goes on. The list goes on. Yes, the list goes on. The thing I think that sets this year apart from some of the other years is, I, you know, I think the, the games that I listed here, they're definitely all super memorable. We'll be talking about these games for a long time, but it was yeah. just everything in between as well. Like, there was no break this year. Like, the games that didn't get listed here, they were all great, too. Yeah. And we had a great time playing those versus some of these other years. Like, there were long waits mm -hmm. in between those games yeah. where you were, you know, you would keep playing those games, and, th and that was fun. But this year, it was just like game, 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 game. And I think the other thing is, is like, even though a lot of these are sort of sequels or, you know, um, an extension of series from the past... It's like definitively the best that this game has ever been, which is really incredible. Like how they pulled this off, it's like it's like when you you know read a book and you read the second book and the second book kind of sucks because it never lives up to the hype of the right. first book. Right. Like no, the second book for all of these games were great and they like totally exceeded the first book. Even if, then the first book was like a ten out of ten. Like yeah. how do they do that? It's amazing. You know, like people say like. Yeah, Tears of the Kingdom is like, you know, the foundation that Breath of the Wild built, like, made Tears of the Kingdom this uh, incredible game. You know, Baldur's Gate 3, like, oh my, oh my goodness, they brought back this, like, series in, like, the most iconic way possible. Um, Spider-Man 2 builds upon Spider-Man 1 in such a great way and, like, launched this into a new height. Like, you can say that's for every single game on this list. And it's kind of crazy how every single one of these did that you know so that from that perspective i think it's like you're very i'm very encouraged because it's like oh wow like we have such a great like looking at this list of games going back all the way back to 96 it's like we have all these great games but people are not done like the industry is not done like innovating on what it could, what could come next so please give me your top three and then your top year overall um, my top three is 2017, 2004, and this year, 2023. Oh, okay. I might have recency bias, but yes. 2023. My top year is 2004, though. Wow. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I just, it's too personal mm -hmm. um, for me. I can't untangle it. But that was the year where I just realized, like, so much about what video game games actually mean to me and how important they are in my life and how it's not not just like just going to pick up a controller and play or whatever um and uh, and so many of the games on this list like solidified that for me so yeah it, it, it truly is amazing i don't think i would be here right now if it wasn't for the games that i played in 2004 shout out to world of warcraft yeah um, because wow amazing stuff my top three are 2004, 2007, and 2017. 2004, 2007, 2007. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, and as far 2007. As, the, as far as the top one, it's hard. Um, I'll say 2004, too, and I, okay. I, I explained why, and it, it's, you yeah. know, it's a very personal reason. But, yeah, me too. Um, I think you know, yeah. when everybody's got personal reasons for making these choices. But. Yeah. 2017 is a close second, though. Also for personal reasons, but, right. but also undeniably incredible in terms of what happened in 2017. But yeah, that was like a career high um, highlights for sure. And yeah, getting a chance to, to be part of that, you know, part of gaming history in that way is really incredible. And like, we're very lucky to have done that. So, yes. As 
I said at the top, we polled our Patreon subscribers on these years, and we gave them these same years. There was a, an unfortunate clerical error, <laughs> and what? 2007 was omitted from the poll. I apologize. <gasps> oh, no. But it didn't matter. It mattered not oh, because, because we had yeah. a runaway winner right. with 54. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> of the vote. 2017. Yes. Lock it up. Whoa. Uh, second place, 2023. 1998 got 13. 2001 got 10. Let's, let's say, fine. Let's, let's say 20, 2007 got like 20%. It doesn't matter. 2017 is still a runaway. It's going to run away. Yeah. Yes. Kyle LaBeouf says, it's hard to beat 2017. Nintendo redefined multiple genres in a single year and arguably had one of the greatest console launch window lineups and turnarounds in gaming history. Yes. PUBG was not the only Battle Royale to release in 2017. Fortnite's Battle Royale mode released that yeah. year as well, and the genre has completely exploded. These two forces have been two of the greatest forces still driving gaming. Six years later, Nintendo Switch and Fortnite Battle Royale. True. Maybe they should team up. No. Just saying. They never will. I want to see Mario do the gritty. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> Mario shall never gritty. <laughs> he did do, what was that stupid dance that they, the Harlem Shake? Oh, the Harlem Mario Shake. Mario has done yeah, that. Mario. Put that in Fortnite and we might have a deal. Oh. <laughs> this is how we make it happen. Mario Shuffle? This is how we make it happen. The little. The little oh, that part. would be cute. If that, if, that became, if that became a Fortnite emote? It's very cute. The Mario RPG shuffle? Okay. He can dab. Hmm. That's from a long time. <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to dab. Anyways. Uh, Riven says, while 2017 and 2023 were both amazing years for games, I think they're both too recent to fully appreciate their oh. impact. Oh. Riven, from the mountaintop. Dropping the wisdom. I chose 1998 because games like Metal Gear Solid, Half-Life, mm -hmm. Ocarina of Time, and StarCraft were all genre-defining, genre-shifting, or genre-creating games <gasps> that have continued to shape games to this day, 25 years later. The lasting impact of those games, many of which are still celebrated today, is simply phenomenal. That's a great comment. I agree. There's so much, there's such a great foundation yeah. when we look back that was built in those days that like still is what everything sits on now. So Riven super just important. took us all to school. <laughs> Linked Triforce says, 1996 Aww. holds a very special place in my heart as the N64 was my first home console. And while I loved my Game Boy, the N64 and Super Mario 64 in particular is what really made me the lifelong gamer and Nintendo fan I am today. Mm. However, oh. I just have to give it to 2017. That first year of the Switch was just legendary, and even beyond the individual games themselves, it was just a welcome and satisfying comeback for Nintendo. Yes. Yes, the comeback. The comeback. Everybody loves an underdog story. True. So this true. is why it's scary now, because you's on top. I'm worried. I'm a little, I'm a little bit worried. <laughs> K120N64 says, years oh. like 1998 and 2001 get discussed often as great years, but the best year ever f in gaming for my tastes was mm. 2010. Wasn't oh, even, 20, wasn't even wasn't considered. Wasn't even on this. Okay, why though? With incredible games like Kirby's Epic Yarn, oh. Super Mario Galaxy 2, Pac-Man Championship Edition DX, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, Tatsunoto vs. Capcom, v -v 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 -v. <laughs> and more, there is no single year where I specifically oh, have been yeah. better fed. Wow. Love it. Yeah. And finally, Lucas Vitroller says, I think your fan base is too young <laughs> when I see how low 1998 is. StarCraft created esports. Yes, it's whippersnappers like you. Whipper? Who don't understand the history of all this. We are babies. Read a book. <laughs> <laughs> we are babies. Um, Put the sorry. Roblox down and read a book. Oh, Krista, the Roblox. Put it down. I don't know what Roblox is, Yes, honestly. you do. I don't. I see you playing it all I the time. I don't know. Stop Kr it. Krista's game of the year, Roblox. <laughs> V-Bucks are out. Robux are in. I did have a lot of V-Bucks, and I still do. <laughs> <laughs> we need to investigate this some other time. You're, you're, you're hoarding don't, of, don't look into it. You're hoarding a V-Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> don't look into it. My dirty secrets. Um, yes. I, I feel like... The Kit and Krista community and, and Nintendo Minute, you've said this before, kind of exploded in the Switch era. Yes. So I feel like a lot of people that know us know us from the Switch era. Um, although we were, we were, we've been here, okay, people? We have been here. Um, I mean, so look, that's if, if you away. sat out the Wii U generation, I've got no bad feelings against you. I get it. We <laughs> tried really, really hard. I really get it. We tried, though. You missed nothing because all those games got re-released. You missed nothing. I know, but I'm saying you and I tried. What does it have to do with Nintendo us? Nintendo Minute it's, to, like, 
shine a spotlight. This is on not a personal era. attack. I'm personally attacked I'm confused, by but... you telling telling everyone that I am a Roblox about Roblox. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. By my V bug sporting. Wow. Um, wow, that was that fun. That was incredible and fun, <laughs> and I'm glad we could definitively answer that question. Yes. But now it is time for your big Ace Attorney extravaganza. Yes. I will turn it all over to you. And yeah. again, I'll be, I'm going to be taking notes furiously over here. Yes, yeah, so you need to learn a thing or two and get yes, smarter. I want to get learned. Um, we, again, like we said at the beginning, we were able to ask our wonderful Patreon community who are as big of Ace Attorney fans as I am, which I'm, I love, and um, they asked some questions to the legendary producer himself, Kanishi Hashimoto, and we are so excited to get some of his answers back. Um, so let's get started here. Our first question is from Iris Marin. What's the moment when you realize that the Ace Attorney series was a big hit with a devoted fan following? And um, can I can I be uh, Mr. Hashimoto? You can. And read the you responses? can be Hashimoto on if Great. you like. Yes, please. I personally became an avid fan of the series after playing Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney on Game Boy Advance. When Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney trilogy was ported to modern consoles, it truly felt like the fan base had rapidly expanded across the globe. Wow. Wow. I would say that I became a fan um, when it was on the DS. Okay. Yeah. Because that's when I was like, "This, what is this game? And I was, I, my first taste of it was so sweet. Uh, bonus question from Iris Marin. What's your favorite witness breakdown animation? Oh my gosh, the animations are so good. My answer would give away the culprit for that specific case. So I'll have to, kept, have to keep that a secret. <laughs> no spoilers for me. Even to this day, no spoilers. Wow. Oh, legendary I love stuff. It. I love it. <laughs> yeah. But it is true. There is so many like amazing animations in this game. And that's what makes it like funny and unique. So, oh my gosh. I wish I'd know though. Can you like whisper this in my ear or something? Because I would like to know. Um, okay. Gartooth asks, which game in the Ace Attorney series is your favorite? And which protagonist is your favorite in the series between Phoenix Wright, Apollo Justice, and Ryonosuke Naruhodo? I like all the games in the Ace Attorney series, but I'd venture to say that the fifth mainline entry, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Dual Destinies, takes the cake as my favorite wow. game. I'm a fan of all the protagonists, but Apollo Justice is my current favorite. You can experience Apollo's story of growth across three titles in Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy. I hope you'll check the collection out when it releases January 25th, 2024. Yes, this is amazing because it is one of, we were just talking about like the underdog story. Like this is truly that is like, he's like a, a new, newly fledged lawyer and he kind of like is not good at his job yet. And you see him grow and become like, an amazing attorney, just like Ace. So, yeah, I love it. Okay. This next question, I'm going to need some explanation. <laughs> I'm a little lost on this one. I'm not going to explain it to you. You're not? No. Why? If you know, you know. But I don't know. I Y K Y K. I, I don't know. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> uh, totally, Joe Ed asked the most important question on this list: ladder or step ladder? Again, if you know, you know. And we have a different answer. We have a different person answering this question. This is Janet Sue, who is a localization director. Yes, and she says, please forgive my lack of ladder discrimination. <laughs> and me, this is Kit, I have no clue what the, any of this means. This is just like when you watch the Alan Wake 2 dance performance. Yes. Like, I was like, this is the best thing ever. And you're like, just what the heck is going on? stone faced watching this. Huh? What, what is happening right now? Huh? Uh, please look it up. Uh, okay. Frulio, I love this question. Are you a fan of true crime? What are your favorite true crime stories and how do these influence the different cases in Phoenix Wright? I enjoy reading mystery novels, but I admittedly can't think of any specific cases in Apollo Justice Ace Attorney trilogy that were directly influenced by true crime stories. And that mm. was back to Mr. Hashimoto answering yes. that one. Yes, yeah, interesting. I was wondering about that. I feel like the true crime, like, true crime is too real. That's why it's called true crime. And Right. The, these, these often have a more, like, fantastical yeah, exactly. element sometimes, right? These have very a very fantastical element. And they, they kind of read more like, um, like Agatha Christie mystery novels or, like, 
old school okay. mystery novels, like Sherlock Holmes kind of stuff, mm. versus it being like true crime, like gritty. Yeah. Case. Although the, the, there's like murder and stuff in these in these cases, so you know it's a little true crimey. All right. Uh, Jay Rando. I was excited to hear about a new addition to Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy, the Animation Studio. Can you discuss how the addition of the Animation Studio came about and the thought process that goes into new features and content for this kind of game collection? We wanted to make sure both longtime series fans and first time players would be able to enjoy the additional features in Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy. We also wanted to incorporate something new and exciting that hadn't been in previous collections, which helped us arrive at our decision to include the animation studio. Yeah, you can check that out in the new game. So what is that? So yeah, you basically can go into the animation studio and like play around with the different animations, which is so iconic in the game. And um, yeah, it's just like, if you're a fan, I think the, you know, the animations in this game is like what makes them really special. So, yeah, they mm. added this. They have a gallery, which is really cool. Um, they also added the ability for you to, like, fast forward and just, like, skip to the chapters you want to play. Um, so, yeah, all of this stuff is in the new uh, Ace Attorney trilogy. It's really fun to mm. like, poke around in there because there's a lot of new stuff added that, you know, is beyond the three games that are included in the collection. Sweet. Yeah. Um, Tescoob asks, as a junior level game developer, I would like to ask, what advice do you have for people new to the game industry? Oh, I'm sorry, new to the game development industry. Is there anything you wish you knew when starting out? The term game developer covers a, diver a diverse range of roles, planners, programmers, designers, sound engineers, and producers, just to name a few. I recommend that you start by identifying what sort of work you want to do within game development as well as the type of games you want to work on and the components you want to create. With so many options available, professionals who set concrete goals such as I want to write scenarios for Ace Attorney slash adventure games or I want to design character models for Street Fighter slash fighting games will have a better chance of achieving them than just those with more general goals. For example, anything is fine, I just want to make games. Once you know the things you wish you had known before, you can use that knowledge to push forward towards your goals. Best of luck with your professional endeavors. That's Aww, a great answer. That's a good answer. Very, good answer. Very like practical advice. Um, so hopefully Tuscoop can take that and, and run with it. Um, we love doing these in our bonus Q and A's. Rapid fire questions. This one is from Ninja Eleven. So here are our rapid fire Ace Attorney questions. Favorite character? Athena Sykes. Favorite case? Turnabout Reclaimed, the special episode from Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, Dual Destinies. Favorite animation? Trucy Wright's Bashful Animation. Favorite defense attorney? Apollo Justice. Favorite prosecutor? Miles Edgeworth. <laughs> That's a good one. Favorite song? Pursuit, Keep on Cornering, from Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, Dual Destinies. Destinies. Favorite uh, Ace Attorney meme? Update the autopsy <laughs> report. Oh, it's got to update that autopsy, autopsy report. Awesome. So thank you once more to the wonderful producer of the Ace Attorney series, Kenichi Hashimoto-san, for answering all of our community questions. Um, this is great. I've been, I, I have the game already. Very excited. What? So I've been playing, wow. I've been playing it. Um, but anyways, we'll talk about it a little bit more in our games or uh, games we're playing section. Oh. Well, that is just a few moments away. Thank you to uh, the great people at Capcom for, for doing that with yeah, us. That was a lot you. of fun. So fun. Uh, before we get into the games we're playing, I've got to say this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Thank you, BetterHelp. Thank you. We were just talking at the top of the episode about how we've got this great tradition of giving gifts to one another. And, you know, everybody, whether it's in your family or your friends or people you work with, everybody's got their own kind of arrangement, arrangements and traditions for giving gifts. But you are the one who defines how you give to yourself. And the holiday season is the perfect time to do that. Very important that you pay attention and give to yourself this holiday season as well as to others. That's right. And one great gift that you can give to yourself is the gift of a better help therapist. It's tough. I think a lot of people experience um, you know, some challenging feelings around the holidays, around the end of the year, around the beginning of of a new year, these can be 
times of reflection and it can be tough and it's really helpful to have somebody like a better help therapist to kind of help you through some of those thoughts that you might be having. Yeah, so we both use BetterHelp and find it very helpful. It is extremely flexible. Uh, you take a short questionnaire to get matched up with a therapist, and then from there you can speak to them in so many different ways. You can do it on video, you can do it on audio, you can do it on text only. So it is really there to uh, meet the availability that you have and the needs that you have. And we really recommend that you give it a look. So in the season of giving, give yourself what you need with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kit and Krista today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Kit and Krista. And we'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. We have a loaded games we're playing section. I don't know how this happened. Uh, yeah, it's dabble time. That's now why. that we are out of the new release uh, treadmill some time to check out some other stuff mm -hmm. and something that i a week ago i would have been really surprised to say that we are leading this off with i know is that you checked out the new god of war dlc the yeah. valhalla dlc which so this was announced at the game awards yeah in an extremely underwhelming trailer i thought i was very confused about what this was when i saw the trailer at the game awards and i was like is this some sort of boss rush that's what i thought too it's like so, this... some kind of flimsy like let's yeah. repackage the stuff we already have. Right? Is it like I, I step into an arena right. and they just kind of waves and waves of bosses and I fight them with the weapons that I already have and the skills I already have and then we call it a day. I was just I didn't know what this was, so I kind of brushed it off as one of the many announcements during the game awards that just over my head. And then we come back and everyone is talking about this DLC. They're like. The trailer did not give this justice. Gotta this try justice. this. This Everyone is amazing. Gotta try it. First of all, it's free. So cheapy me. I was like, I'm on board already. So I was excited by that. Um, so yeah, I, I did get a chance to play this uh, over the weekend. And wow! So what is this? I still don't exactly know what this is. Okay. So this is a... There is a story element to this that's sort of supposed to wrap up Kratos' story, and, and if you guys remember, and I'm not going to try to, I'm not spoiling the ending of Ragnarok for you, but the game does kind of end where it's a bit open for Kratos, like you you kind of see yeah, yeah. him get to, I'm trying to be very careful here, get to a place and then like, it's like, what's next for him? And you don't really like get an answer True. to that at the True. end of Ragnarok, which is fine. But, and, and, but they did say that this is the end of that like... Norse mythology, like God of War thing. So you're like, oh, I, I wish I did understand, but you know, what kind of happens to this version of Kratos yeah. at the end of this game. So this DLC does that. So you you basically, they set the sets of the story where you get this mysterious invitation to go to Valhalla. And you like, in true Kratos fashion, like break, break into Valhalla. And of course that does not go well for you. Um, and you have to basically like, Get some help from some of your friends like Freya and, and the Valkyrie sisters and stuff like that. And then when you get the gameplay though, is like a like a rogue roguelike sort of gameplay where you need to like do like battle for as long as possible. And as you go through like each room, and each rooms are, are different realms, they're not in any order. You basically get these runes that like augment these glyphs. I think they're called actually that augment your skills. So you can add like stuff to your um, chaos blades or your axe or your health or whatever. Um, and there are boss fights like sprinkled throughout as well. And then if you lose, if you die, you basically get back to the beginning. Um, and then every single time you get like further, there's like some story cutscene that happens. So you're oh. like unraveling it a little bit at a time. Like he has like this cutscene, and you're like, what is happening? And Mimir is also with you, so Mimir offers some great, like, dialogue to help you understand what's going on. Um, it is so good. Like, I am so in on this. Um, I am doing okay. It's a little bit like my Hades experience where it's like I'm chipping away at it a little bit. Um, there's different difficulty levels as well. Oh, I'm good. not playing on the easiest difficulty because I have some pride. Um, so I'm playing at, like, the middle one. And The default? There's like six levels. Oh, that's a lot. Okay. One of them looks really hard. Yeah, don't do <laughs> so that. So I'm literally the one in the middle, whatever that All right. is. All right. um, 
And yeah, I, I've already gotten to a couple of like story cut scenes. I'm not going to say it here that I'm like, oh, what's happening? And you don't know who invited you to Valhalla. So you have to find, you have to find out who that, that person is. Do you know yet? No. Oh. And um, so you do probably need to finish this so, to, to see know. to get that last bit right. of the story. Right. And you said this this is like an addition to the base game's ending? It feels like it. It feels like it. Because it, cause again, the base game is ending. And it, it tells you like very clearly before you start. It's like, have you finished Ragnarok? You cannot play this until you finish Ragnarok. The game tells like, you like that. Like it physically will not let you or oh, no, it, it doesn't recommend it? doesn't it. recommend it. Okay. It's like, please, tell, like, please, please yeah. finish the story mode in Ragnarok to huh. play this DLC. Um... Anyways, I don't want to spoil it because it's so good and y'all should go play it if you like God of War because it is like truly a essential part of this experience that I didn't realize until I started playing. And um, yeah, I, I need to get further to figure out what's going on, but I'm getting better and I'm like like understanding my, like I know what like glyphs to put where now a little bit better because at first I was like, I have don't remember how to play this game. Yeah, honestly. how I was gonna say how how was it getting back into the groove of playing that game? Not bad. All right. I was okay. Like after you, you have all your stuff. You have your blades, you have your axe, you right. have your spear, you have like cool armor. <laughs> you have like and then the glyphs augment gives you like special skills. Right. Right. Um and you can also like choose some things like before you go in, like you can put it into health, you can put it into rage, you can kind of pick like how you want to play this thing. Um, yeah, no, it, it is quite amazing. So it's free. So definitely go check it out. I mean, really no reason not to. So, yeah. It's so interesting that they would have what, what seems to be a, a significant story thing come out like a year later in yeah. this DLC. Kind of reminds me of that conversation we were having about that Baldur's Gate epilogue a couple weeks ago. It's like, what happened? Maybe, I don't know if they've done, the team's done any interviews or maybe there's something up on the PlayStation blog. I'd love to learn more about yeah. what they're, how they got to it's this. It's amazing that it's free, too. Like, easily could well, be paid DLC. I mean, if it is the true ending, like, or, or part of the ending, I sure. can understand where they're like, we can't sell this. Like, that's okay. that's a bummer. If, if they if they truly see this as this extension yeah. of the game. They should have put that in the trailer, though. Their, their the, trailer, trailer. the trailer was not the best for Because if they, they had said, like, you know, this is the the way to conclude Kratos's journey. Right. You know, in this Ragnarok series, or in this in this Norse Norse mythology series, um, uh, yeah, then we would yeah. have all been on board I'm, like I'm right away. I'm with you. Though. That was really confusing why they didn't do that because the trailer did not do a good job communicating that at all. Yeah, I wanted to start this last night, and then I realized I had uninstalled. It's God of War, game. and it's like, well, to it's going to take yeah. me a while to download these yes. 150 gigs, so I guess this will be later. Yeah. I, d d yes. Give yourself time, though, if you want to play it like that <laughs> that day. You have to, so the game, you need to download the game, and then you need to download the um, DLC, and then install the DLC, because I didn't know that, and I had downloaded it in my PlayStation app, and I was like, I'm ready to play. And then I went no, you're to not. Go install it and I was like, oh, no, I'm that not that ready to play. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's like huge. Yeah. <laughs> give cool. Yourself, give cool. yourself time. Well, hopefully you can finish that and tell us more about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this this week. So good. You have also been playing so we when we were in LA for the game awards. This is a game that we had not heard of up to that point, but right. then so many people told us, like, oh, this is one of my favorite games of the year. Yeah. You have to play this. I hope this, you know, gets recognized when people talk about the best games. It's Chance of Sonar. What yes. is this? Um, this is a very unique puzzle game based around language. So I'm playing this game on Switch. Um, it's beautiful. The, the, the visuals are really the striking. The visuals are very striking. The color palette is very unique. It's a very like kind of like a desert scape um, color yeah. palette. And yeah, the, the idea is, is that you are trying to get through this world, but you don't know the language. You're basically seeing like what looks like hieroglyphics. And you get to a point and you have to make some educated guesses about what that symbol means and start to translate it. And you have a little notebook and you can write down your notes about like 
What could the symbol mean? And it starts out pretty easy, like open and close, like open this door, close this door. Like you, like, okay, I, I can kind of like backwards engineer this. But then it gets like really hard because you're talking to people and it's just gibberish. And then they, some the glyphs that you do translate and you get right, that shows up as like the words. But it's like me blank 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 open, and you're like. Okay, <laughs> so you basically have to go around like trying to decipher this language, and it's done really well. Like, there's so many ways for you to do that. You could like just guess it while you're talking to people. You can look at like stuff in your environment. Like, um, there's like these carvings on the wall that you can kind of glean from it, like what it means.、Um, but yeah, I imagine this is exactly what it's like when you were like if you were. Some sort of archaeologist like tra translating like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics in a temple, like that's what that must feel like because it's like I don't know and I have very limited in information to try to piece this together. And there's also a very interesting story happening. Like I have no idea what's happening, but I'm like something mysterious is going on, and I want to know what it is, but I can't know until I translate this thing. So, yeah, it's really、hmm. it's very good, very very hard though, like really hard. At least does, for me. Does the game give you hints somehow? No. Well, I guess you can always look it up. You can look it up, but it's hard. This is not a game for me. No. Sounds cool though. I was gonna say like you would not. <laughs> this like is this not.、Game. I will not be playing this game. You would not、game. like this game. <laughs> it is very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's really good. Very cool. I finished last night Star Wars Jedi Survivor. That's、Ooh. a game I've been playing for a little bit, and <clears throat> my. My overall feeling now that I've finished this game is like this is such an interesting what if case.、Mm. This game could have been really high on my top ten list. Yeah. If only some things were different. Like game design. <laughs> Critically. The, the, the level design. Yeah. Like this game does so many other things really well, and it has great mechanics. It has a lot of replay value.、Um, There seems to be a lot of interesting side content that you can explore these areas and find. There were, I think, five different lightsaber stances that all play really different. So if you want to do combat differently, you can totally and like you can power all of those up, and there's perks for all of those.、Mm -hmm. Like this game has a lot going for it. This game also, like, I really came to appreciate this game's take on Star Wars. Like now, Star Wars, if you follow it. Is a little bit different than like the more classic George Lucas days,、yeah. where now there's this guy Dave Filoni who's kind of in charge、yeah. of it, and he's got like a slightly different feel for it and take on it. And some of that stuff's been hit or miss. This is this feels very firmly in the Lucas style. Oh, really? And they really just know it, it, it's like things that are hard for me to even like describe, but it feels very Star Warsy、mm -hmm. in ways that are great. Like the, seems like they had like a lot of fan fan. There, there is there. fan service, but there's all more, like more subtle touches. Like like the music is very like in that original John Williams. Oh wow! Style,、um, even like so. You're fighting a lot of stormtroopers. Like the voice that they use for the stormtroopers is so like in line with the voice from the movie. It's like it's like a throwaway thing that a lot of people won't notice. But like, as a big Star Wars fan, I was like, "That's the voice for the stormtrooper.、Yeah. That's that's it."、Um, they really did dial that in well. But yeah, the the level design of this game is just a mess, and it I found it to be. In, so there's like kind of one. You go to a number of planets, and there's one planet that's significantly bigger in terms of the area you can explore、yeah. than the others. And that was the one where I had the most problems in terms of knowing where to go. Like we talked about this on previous episodes. Like the game has a map that is not helpful. The game has a system where you can it can make a sound if you're going in the right direction. That thing will just be going off constantly, no matter where you're going.、Mm -hmm. Not helpful at all. A lot of like it'll point you in the wrong direction, or or the places you should go feel counterintuitive versus the dead ends that like oh surely that's the way to go.、Oh. So there's just a lot of frustration in these more open settings. Yeah. But there are times where the game like like people would see this as a negative, but it's like where the game is kind of guiding you down a single path. And that's fine. The game is kind of at its best when it's those. It's and, like it's trying to be this open world game, but it shouldn't. Right. Because it, it thinks that 
the only way to be like a triple A title is being an open world game. A little bit. And the first game in this series was a bit more, you know, down a path. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I can see why they wanted to try and expand it for this one. But that, that part of it just, just didn't work. So, like, I feel like, I think my final, again, we don't review games, but if we did, I think I might give this, like, a seven and a half or an eight, yeah. but if they ha if they didn't have those level design issues, it could, like be, a nine, it could right? be, like, a nine or a nine and a half, honestly. Yeah, that's, that's like, a pretty significant bump up because yeah. of those issues, but, yeah. yeah, it can be very frustrating when a game that's trying to be an open world game does that to you, you know? You feel really, like... Like, why did I spend, like, two hours wandering around? Yeah, so, so I'm really glad I ended up playing it. Um, I, I did get a lot of enjoyment out of it, but there was also a lot of moments of um, frustration. How was the ending? Honest. The ending, so, so there is, near the end, there is a pretty big plot twist oh. where a person who is in your kind of traveling party who you thought was, like, one of your closest allies ends up being the big bad. <gasps> And that that was surprising to me. I, I didn't see that coming. Oh wow! Because the game did pr prior to that point have a very clear like this is the bad guy. So that was surprising, oh. and that was that was done effectively. I thought I didn't see that coming. Um, yeah, the ending was good. It was it was not it was not super drawn out, but it did touch on a lot of the themes of the game, um, set up some stuff potentially for the future. I, th I thought it was good. And then there's like there's a ton of new game plus stuff which I'm not going to be doing. Yeah. Uh, I, I immediately uninstalled it so I can make room for God of War. <laughs> Ouch! So that I can I gotta like I gotta manage the space. This is a big game. Ouch! But yeah, such such an interesting what what if for me. Huh. It, that's great. I mean, I'm glad that generally you liked it though, because it is like as a huge fan of Star Wars, I feel like your disappointment level can be very. It can drop very quickly if that happens. Yeah. And that's just like, it just sucks when you're a huge fan of a franchise when that happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was just kind of able, initially, I was like shocked at some of these problems I was having. Yeah. But then I was just like, this is just like a flaw of this game. Right. And I just need to, I need to be quick to go to a guide if I'm getting lost because mm -hmm. this, this just keeps happening. So, right. so I'll, my, my issues with that started to be minimized once I knew that's what was funny. happening and how to get yeah. around it. Yeah. Another game that I played and finished, and I talked about this on the Game of the Year podcast last week, but we didn't have a chance to talk about it in depth, is A Highland Song, mm -hmm. which I played on the Switch, which just came out in early December. And this ended up being my, I think, was this my number 10 game? Yeah, I made the list. Of the years, made yeah. the list. So obviously I really liked it. And this was in the indie showcase from a month or so ago. And the idea of this game is you are a girl in Scotland who gets this message from her uncle who lives off in this lighthouse in the Scottish Highlands. He says, come visit me. I want to show you this. There's like this once a year like tides that happen. Ooh. He's like, come, come check this out. And like you're like fighting with your mom. So you basically run away from home. And How old do you think the main character she is? She seems to be maybe like 16 oh, or so, something. Okay. So she, so she runs away um, into the highlands, which is just like wilderness. Right. And she's like, I'm just going to hike to um, Uncle Hamish and, and go visit him and check this out. Oh, wow. And it's a 2D game. And you are, there's a lot of, it, the game is basically entirely traversal. So you're climbing a lot of mountains, mm -hmm. uh, navigating your way through. And it's a 2D game, but there is this element of depth to it. Yeah where you start here and your actual destination is in, like layers is depth. behind. So it's like, yeah. I see it that way, but I can only go this way. So how do I do this? So you gotta like do so one of these, yeah. There are these connecting points, and this is something the game does really well, where you can go from one layer to the next. Yeah, that's cool. And they did a really good, that could have been a really annoying thing, but mm -hmm. it's very seamless to go, when you get to those points, like the game knows when you wanna do it, wow. which, which is great. Um, and there's other points where you'll find like a bridge and you'll, you'll, it's, it's like, a, it'll take like two or three seconds and you see your character like, like walking, walking across, across the bridge and you get, you make and a that, big, you make a big jump. And that's when you go to right. the different layers. There's also Very this really fun thing where you can find these like maps around. And when you get to the top of a mountain, it's like a hand drawn map 
and you're like, where is that again? Uh, and you like try and you try and, and match that the, the camera will zoom out and you try and match the hand drawn maps to like what mm. mountain is that? And if you can actually if you match it correctly and you get to that place, you'll find like a shortcut sometimes. Oh. Which can help you like make a lot of progress. The game says it's on a timer where it's like counting down. It's like, oh, five days to get to Uncle Hamish. And I was very worried that I wasn't gonna make it on time. And I didn't ultimately make it on time, but it didn't matter. But it the seemed, time. It seemed not to matter. I may, the ending like scene, the ending that I got when I finished it seemed fine. Maybe there's some different thing that plays out. If you out. make it on time, maybe it's a different ending. But I don't think people should stress out about the timing. I think that, I kind of wish they didn't have that mechanic. Why do they do that? That's I don't know. scary. I don't know. There, there must be some reason. There must be some different story thing that happens along the way. But it is a very, I found, relaxing game to play. Okay. Um, there's like a rhythm-based thing too, right? Yeah, there's this other thing where I think they do this to help you get across some of the longer stretches in an entertaining way. Okay. Where you'll find these like deer in the mountains and you'll start running with them and it becomes this rhythm game yeah. and this kind of like traditional Scottish music starts playing. <laughs> and, kind of nice. And it becomes like, you know, push this button, push that button and you'll like jump through all the stuff okay. to, the, to the rhythm. It's kind of, it, it's fine. Like it's not, it's not the focus. It's not, all the, it's not the focus of the game. Yeah. Like in the trailer, like they made a big deal out of it. Right. Like it, it was just kind of a fun little diversion. The, um, but the, the vibe of the game is great. The music is really well done. Outside of that, like traditional stuff, there's just like very like, kind of quiet like, classical strings music, Ooh, which I really like. Nice. I've been to Scotland. I went in 2018, so I've I've actually been to the Scottish Highlands, yeah. and it is like a really amazing, beautiful, beautiful place. Sure. So that this is a game where I feel like my enjoyment is enhanced by having been there yeah. and seeing it. Yeah. And like, I got this like aha moment, like wow, Scottish people like really are super into the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So for them to go on this kind of like really rugged hike feels very in like character to that. for yeah. them. So I felt like I just had a, a little bit more of understanding of what this game was, was about and kind of that place that it was trying to tell. But you can tell I, I really like this game a lot. So check it out. Yes, yes. And you couldn't um, care less. I know I do care. <laughs> You're like, next. No, I do care. I saw you playing because I'm a plane for like a long time. Yes. I'm trying to think if I have anything else to say about Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy that we didn't talk about already. I think I might have Save it. it. Save it. You've already talked about it? What? What? <laughs> <laughs> anything more to say? Yeah. But what have you already said? We, we we were doing as we were doing the um, interview. Oh, beyond the interview. Beyond the interview. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, well, how um, far have you already played through it, or or what? So I have been actually playing this in a different way because of the ability for you to go to any chapter. Okay. I've played all these games before. I see. So now I'm just playing the chapters that I really really like, which is kind of funny because I never thought that I would be able to play this game out of sequence like this, but it's. Actually kind of fun like huh. to play it out of sequence like this. So if you are someone that's like, oh, I don't know, if should I play this again? Because you probably already you might have already played um, and know like the endings to these. But playing them out of sequence is kind of fun. It's like a nice little, like, oh, I remember this chapter being really interesting. I'm just going to play that chapter. Yeah. You yeah. know? So I've been doing that a lot and then also checking out like the animation studio and the gallery and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of extras in this in this game that I've been enjoying. Um yeah, I'm actually not not sure if I'll like play it all three from beginning to end again, but I really do like that they give you the option to just jump around like that. It's really nice. Okay. Last thing on here, it's not something I've done or played, but something I'm gonna do. Uh -huh. And it was this amazing revelation I had over the weekend with Baldur's Gate 3. Because obviously <laughs> I spent I was like, what is this? I obviously <laughs> spent a ton of time on this game and it was my game of the year this year, but I've kind of been itching to get back into it and what I wanted to do was get the Steam Deck version of Which it. Which people say is very good. Yeah, I'm just so fascinated at how they shrunk that game and made it work on the Steam Deck and people say it runs great on mm -hmm. the Steam Deck and I'm just so interested in that. And I was like, man, you know, I've got this kind of like one completed save file and you know, once I get going, I might want to be able to switch between the TV and the Steam Deck because I've got the game on PS5. 
it would just be so great if they had some patch that had a you know cross save sharing. Mm-hmm. And I just started like Googling. It turns out this is a feature that's already been available like you since, missed, since you, the summertime. You missed this feature. I don't know somehow. how I missed this, but I did. Yeah. And thank goodness that they have it. This is a great feature. Not enough games have this feature. I was honestly. just gonna say, more games, please put this, make this a feature. Yeah, you know, like, like, like just it's so. In this day and age, we just want it all the ways, you know? I mean, one game that has this feature, like, super well done is Disney Dreamlight Valley. I was just going to say, Disney Dreamlight Valley is the one that does it It's, super it's very well. easy to share it across whatever version you're playing. Yeah. So, I made my Larian account last night. Um, I'm very excited nice. to start a new game on the Steam Deck and, you know, see how smooth that is to go between the two. Because I don't think I'm... Again, I'm not going to play... Like the full game again, but I do. But want... that first act, like you were yeah, saying, exactly. is so good. Wanna, and you can make a different character. I want to fool around in that first act and make some different characters. Can... I want to do a druid. I remember I said the whole time I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the druid, and then I totally wussed totally out, wussed out because at the druid character have creation. To be a, I have to be a dwarf. Well, and then now you can also um, not make your fatal error and keep that woman alive. I do want. Killed. I do, do want to get her. No, no, she just ran away. You, the cage, and then she got. The cage, she got herself killed. You messed up the cage. I had part. nothing to do with that. You did have something to do with it. You didn't take her out. Of I cage. came on a dead. I walked up to a dead body. I, didn't, I was like, "What happened here?" Oh, well, you didn't know oh, her to the cage. Oh, it's her. You I left didn't know her how. in there. I can't believe it's that. Not my fault. No, it is your fault. But, She's very good. Huh? She's very good. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to very get very good. But I mean, they they continue to put out patches for this game like really rapidly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I must have just missed it because I totally would have bought the, the Steam Deck version mm -hmm. when I was playing this back in what August. This is how you know that this is like truly your game of the year because you are not the kind it's of very person unlike me. Yeah. to replay anything. It's true. Because you're such like a I have so many games to play. Right. Move on to the next one. Right, right, right. But just like you're going back to it means something because yeah, it must have. You know, it's true. It must have been good. <laughs> wow, that's a big games oh, we're playing goodness. section. We wow. also have a big news set. We playing, do. We we're have a catch some up. Catch up, right? We need a catch up because this. we did game of the year last year. We did not have any news, and there's a lot that's happened. So yes. let's jump into it. E3 is gone. Once more. <laughs> <laughs> For real this time. For real this time. Uh, they put out a tweet, after more than two decades of E3, each one bigger than the last. That's not true. The time oh. has come to say goodbye. Thanks for the memories. E3. Yes, let's let's not forget the 2017, or 2007? The, the one that was in the other The location. Santa Monica the Santa Airport. Santa Monica Airport. E3. That was the strangest Paper one Paper walls was what I remember from that. Very strange. Very strange. But, yeah. I mean... People were asking us, like, oh, like, are you going to do a big reaction to this? Or like, how do you feel? It's like, I feel like this has happened, like, five times this year already. This is like that thing where it's like someone has broken up and gotten back together. <laughs> and now they're back. Like, a lot of times. Like, someone in your friend yeah. group. And you're like, I don't care anymore. Right. Like, you always do this. So I don't care. <laughs> um, if they get back together, E3. It's true. I will not care. No, it's true. Kidding. It's I true. I don't really care. Um, but, yeah, it does, it does feel like it's... It's been on its, like, I guess, like, life support dying breath, like, for a long time. So now it feels unimpactful. But, yeah, it is, it feels definitive this time. It feels like the real deal. Like, a lot of the times it was kind of, like, wishy-washy. Like, oh, we're still thinking about what to do, so on and so forth. Now it does feel very permanent. Um, we were talking not only to each other, but to our other, you know, Nintendo friends that we keep in contact with. And we were like, thank goodness we had the 2019 E3. The last one. Because that was our last E3, and that was the last true sort of E3 in, in its E3 glory days, I, I suppose. And we yep. had some really cool stuff that happened during that E3, including the reveal of Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. And... I got all these text messages um, when this happened from one of my good friends, one of our good friends who used to work at Nintendo. And she was like, I'm so glad that you and I were in the room together when they revealed Tears of the Kingdom in 2019 during oh. E3. Because her and I shared like an all-time like fangirl hype moment. And it's like, yeah, that, that, that was something cool that was facilitated at E3, you know, um, there's not there's not a lot of places times of the year and, and places where 
we had this like concentration of the games industry and all of these big announcements are happening. You can expect to be like excited and, and surprised by stuff like that. That was something that was really cool about E3. And I hope that maybe, you know, in the future we'll have something like that again, like sort of a all hands on deck kind of thing for the industry. But otherwise it, it did feel like this was quite dated and something that just really can't, can't exist in its current state in this day. That is the proof that I can keep a secret. Knowing, knowing Tears of the King, being like one of like 10 people I'm to know. I'm a little bit mad at you, Why? honestly. Because you're not supposed to keep a secret from me. Well, I can and you can't. That's a problem. Excuse me? <laughs> you know it's true. I wouldn't have told anybody. You know it's true. That it is, is true. That is the proof. I always ask you, like, uh. what secrets do you have? And you always say you don't have any, uh. but I think you have a lot. I don't know. What are they? Even now. I know. Big secrets. What are they? Can't tell you. No. Can't tell you. <sighs> I think it's disappointing. I think it's good that they did this now versus waiting longer and stringing people along because that's what's happened the last couple of years. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're going to go down to the wire and then pull the plug at the last second mm. where a lot of companies had been planning, planning to stuff. go. Yeah. And they have to try and make sense of it. Yeah. So now I do, I'm very curious to see in June, obviously Jeff Keeley will do his thing, mm -hmm. but who else, else is happens? going to say, let's give ourselves some breathing room and like, you know, Sony did something in May last year. Or yeah. do we just see a bigger diversification of dates in the summer right. when people make right. big announcements? And is that good I or bad? I think they should. I think they should. You think they should? I think they should, yes, because yeah. they can have that moment all of the, I mean, as long as you have like- Significant- a, a good news? amount of news, have that time to yourself mm -hmm. and, and don't compete with the rest of the industry. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there, again, there's always the option of, of being a part of the Jeff Keighley show and saying we can benefit from all the reach that he's going to get. Yeah. You can always argue both Creating sides of Creating like an event sort of around something. If exactly. You don't, maybe if you don't think that your news can stand on its own. Right. Could be beneficial. Um yeah, there's a lot of different options now, for sure, and I'm and I'm curious to see how these you know big companies will handle it. Um, and I've seen some people saying like, "Well, gosh, now Jeff Keeley just you know has the industry cornered." The thing is, like, people don't have to do his event the same right, way they right. felt compelled to do E3 because they were in the ESA. Right. And they were paying money to the ESA to put on this show. True. And they were sitting at this table with all the other people in the industry saying, you're going to do this. We're all going to do this, right? You have to handshake right. together. There's yeah. not that whole element of, like, collective pressure to represent the industry has nothing to do with what Jeff Keeley's doing. Right. It's truly, like... If you want to do this, great. If you don't, fine. Yeah. There's no like hard feelings. We're doing the showcase. If you want to be part of it, good for you. Right. Fine. Right. But so if that's not, one yeah. reason why yeah. like what, what he does will really struggle to ever reach the heights of classic E3 because right. he's just not going to get all the same people involved. Like Nintendo has been very clear of like they don't, they don't want any part of Summer Game Fest. Yeah. Yeah. They're exactly. going to keep doing their own thing. They so, want to do their own thing. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see, and and uh, I, I think that will be good. There is a need in the industry to share news in the summer, though, because that's where a lot of the holiday planning begins. begins. You know, talk, I need to share this information with my retail partners, mm -hmm. so I need to make this announcement yeah, in the summertime. Yeah, there's a practical part of it. Exactly. For that timing exactly. is what it is. So so yeah. so you know, as I as I talk about the diversification of dates, I don't think it's going to be that. It's going to be spread like out. People will still need to make announcements in the yeah, summer. It's not, it might not be like the week of E3, like right. that week of June, whatever it usually is. It might just be sort of in that in those summer months. Um, but yeah, it, it, there is something to be said about losing this big moment uh, for the industry. You know, like there is like strength when the industry comes together. So hopefully it doesn't diversify so much that it isn't, we don't have that feeling anymore because there was something good about that. Um, but again, I, I just don't think that like that kind of thing can, this, you know, E3 in its current form, it makes sense in like 2024, you know, it right. just doesn't make sense. I also think of, you know, all of our friends at Nintendo who won't have to go through the ringer of working an E3. And we did a whole podcast. One of our very early podcast episodes was yeah. about what it was like. If you're it's curious, really that's tough. a, that's a good listen. And that was extremely challenging. Yeah. I do think some people loved that though. 
And E3 was like such a like measuring stick at Nintendo for what could make or break your career at Nintendo, which is not fair. Sounds fun. It's not fun for me. <laughs> so, who had, so who had fun with this? <laughs> I think there's a lot of people at Nintendo that love this, including one of your direct reports. So, um, yeah, I just think that. Well, and let, let them lead it one year and see how much they love it. They did. And they <laughs> loved it but hated it at the same time, which was very weird. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of people at Nintendo who like, their literal careers were built on the back of E3, huge high up people, and like, I, what are they gonna do, twiddle their thumbs now and that this show is gone? Like, it's gonna be really well, I mean, that, I mean, it wasn't planned that way, but like, that was Reggie's jumping off point, like having that big moment in mm -hmm. 2000, what was that, 2004? Yeah. Right. That was, that was where his career yeah. took off and he became Reggie. Reg Reggie. Reggie. Yeah. So, yeah. I, he started taking I, yeah. names though. I, f I feel fine about this, I think. I mean, you feel fine about this, but I think there are people inside... You Nin seem to not feel no, fine. No, I feel fine. Mm. I'm just saying people inside Nintendo whose careers are completely dependent on this, like, they must be reeling. I mean, there's also uh, Don James, who's an executive at Nintendo, yep. who helped to cre literally create E3 with the ESA, and I, yeah. you know, you know, I think he's coming up you know, within the next couple of years of the end of his career. As he looks at retirement, you know, he's got to feel like, yeah, this is the end of... A me. big chapter of me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Next. Let's move on here. Whilst the Zelda developers were in Los Angeles for the Game Awards, they did some interviews. And there was something in an interview with IGN that got people talking. Mm. The question <laughs> was about Zelda fans missing more traditional and more traditionally linear Zelda games, and they asked the developers how they feel about that. And I'll just read some of the response from Mr. Aonuma. I do think we as people have a tendency to want the thing that we don't currently have, and there's a bit of a grass is greener mentality. But I also think that with the freedom players have in the more recent games in the series, there is still a set path. It just happens to be the path that they choose. So I think that is one thing I kind of like to remind myself about the current games we are making. But also it's interesting when I hear people say those things because I'm wondering, why do you want to go back to that type of game where you're more limited or restricted in the types of things or ways you can play? But I do understand that desire that we have for nostalgia. And so I can understand it from that aspect, really walking that tightrope. <laughs> Like, I think you guys are idiots, and I'm not going to do yeah, this. I think you're crazy for thinking this, but I can get it. That's what he's saying. He's like, I think you're idiots, right. but I'm gonna, and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. Good for you, Ani. Speaking the hard truths. Um, I think this question is rooted in the idea of those dungeons, though. Um, it all that, come back to these dungeons. It all come back to dungeons. And that, I, think that, <laughs> I think that's what that's what's got a lot of Zelda fans tied into knots, you know, about... This, this open world kind of new era, new style of Zelda games, and potentially the games that we'll see forever in Zelda's in Zelda game future, um, will that be defined by us losing those traditional dungeons? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's what people mean when they ask this question. Um, I'm not sure his answer answers that though. I think he's more so talking about just generally, um, you know, sort of. He, you know, quote, like, broke the conventions of Zelda games. He was like... He himself. He himself was very crack. adamant about breaking the conventions of Zelda games. And I think he's going to continue to walk down that path of convention breaking stuff. I have three things I want to say about this. Oh, boy, um, three? I'm sure I'm going to forget one of them. Number one. Number one is I, I do still think we, are, we will get 2D Zelda games that too. feel more classically oriented, more traditionally oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were releasing... Link Between more, Worlds? When, more, more frequently 2D and 3D Zelda games, that was always the thinking was, yeah, the 2D games, you know, those have kind of more of a nostalgia feel, they're for that more classic fan feeding that. And, you know, the 3D games was like, well, this is the cutting edge of the series. And it's been a while since we got a 2D game, mm. but I do still think that is how they are thinking about things, and there's so much you can do with 2D games, whether they're originals or remakes. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of fertile ground there, so I, I don't think they've given up on those. No, not at all, not at all. Second, I said this a while ago, 
I think there's a big opportunity for other developers to pick up the mantle of the, quote, traditional 3D Zelda game. It's obviously not a Zelda game, but that style of game... Can exist with another, like, IP. Right, right. It feels like, you know, people can make that style of game and make it really well now. Yeah. And, like, if I was an indie developer, I would be looking close at that of, like, hey, we can make a great classic Zelda mm -hmm. game. Like, you know, we love those games. We grew up on those. We can put our own spin on those and yeah. make something really amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe... Maybe people only want Zelda, but you know, maybe that could be like, uh, you know, a happy a happy go between of like, yeah, we still have those games. They're not Zelda games, but they're still that style, that genre, and and they're great. Yeah. Like, yeah. look at how many Metroidvanias have have come up now. True. There there was a time where it was Metroid and Castlevania, and that was it. And now so many games have picked that up. But, but like, that's it's not a, a Metroid. You said this before. You, you're a hater on this big idea. I, I don't know. You're a I hater. feel like there's something You very... don't like the Metroid games either. You don't like any of those. I do like Metroid You hate games. them all. I don't hate them. but I Make think... it yourself if you're so smart. Well, I can't because he's not making Zelda <laughs> No, you games, do it. So. <laughs> Make it. Make a Zelda game. I would love to, but I again... Um... I feel like, yeah, people have the, a huge opportunity to do that, but it won't be a Zelda game. I don't know. Just that's what it's about. And? Facts. And? Facts. And the problem is? The fa problem is facts. The third thing. I'm oh, not, no, not going to forget you this. forgot it. No, I have not. I want to remind people of the very fragile state this series was in pre-Breath yeah. of the Wild. True. Very true. Where those games were critically acclaimed. But and no they, one was buying the them. The sales were declining. Yeah. It was really uh, reducing in relevance, and it felt like it was on a path to obsolescence versus all these other great series that were introducing new things and changing up the way mm -hmm. and were, be, or, you know, were, were, were getting latched onto by yeah. newer generations of fans. Yes. It was like, we have the old classic Zelda fans and kind of nobody else. And... Breath of the Wild completely changed that. Obviously sold 30 million plus copies. Mm -hmm. Tears of the Kingdom is well on the way to doing the same. So it's like, yes, there was a creative decision behind that, but there was also like some very clear, like we have a business need to do something different, yeah. to change this up. And he is the guy who Did you know, went through all of those phases. So he's like, I feel great now. I've revitalized this franchise. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling good. 30 million people love this versus the 2 million who loved it before. It's simple math for me as Aonuma. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. That he's, His answer pretty much states that. Right. You know? Also, I think there's so many people that are you know, new Zelda fans or they their first experience playing a Zelda game is Breath of the Wild. Right. A much bigger pool than the original Zelda fans that grew up with the series. Um so I think for them, it's like, this is not a problem for them. This is what they know. This is what Zelda is to them. So again, simple math wise, you know, it's like you are going to probably cater to the 30 million plus people that know this version and love this version of Zelda yeah. versus the others that, you know, may be vocal, but are very small right. percentage now. Right. So anyhow, I have complete trust in this team. I, I am, you know, I'm sure that whatever comes next um, is going to be great. Um, and I'm excited that they are doing something. I mean, it sounds like the rest of this interview is all about, you know, sort of they are done with the, the current like world that was Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, what that was set in, they're like done with that. So they're moving on to something completely different. I'm so excited because I know that they're going to come up with something amazing. And I can't wait to see what that's, what next, what is next for this because I think it's going to be great. So I have no, no issues and no like anxiety about that. Okay. Jeff Keeley, staying on the TGAs, mm. has shared that the Game Awards of this year had the highest views oh, wow. of any Game Awards ever, 118 million live streams, up 15% year over year. He's very pleased with this, of as course. he should be. Congratulations. That's a big number. <clears throat> uh, there, I felt like there was more angst about the show this year than there was... I mean, there's always angst about this show, but I felt there was more this year for whatever reason. 
you know, maybe it was because he was shushing people off the stage. The industry is in a shaky state. You know, state. the shaky state of yeah. the industry. But clearly there's an appetite for this show. He also has some some little tricks up his sleeve of how he gets these numbers. Um, you know, he's very... Um, he pursues co-streams with, you know, yeah. having other other content creators stream it and add their reaction to it. He counts that in, mm-hmm. in his numbers. Yes. He's also very aggressive in finding partners in other countries to watch. Yeah. Like, he would come to us and he'd be like, oh, I found this new partner in China. I've got this new partner in India. Like, these big markets right. where you wouldn't think, like, there would be, you know... a Tra- get- traditional viewership for these shows, but he fa- he found it. And then the population is like crazy there. Right. 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 So, yeah. So that I think that's a, a special skill that he has of like leaving no stone unturned right. of finding of people strength, who yeah. can watch his show. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think the question is how far can he take it? I don't know. I I, I can only care so much, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. The big number is, is big again, or it got bigger. Yes, gr- great. I, I I I'm not th- I'm not worried about this going away or anything like that. Yeah. But um, that is a little interesting factoid for him. Yeah, seems like it's always going up every year. I've never seen. You know, he's been doing this for a yeah, while. Yeah, we haven't had a year. I've where not it ever seen a year down. where it's like, oh no. Right. Even in like the pandemic year, I think it did very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this seems like a thing um, that is going to be here. I think that he, people have voiced all of their concerns. I'm sure he's listening to all of that um, and will make changes as needed. And we'll just have to see how it is next year. Yeah. Oh, this Final one. story, The Last of Us Online has been officially dropped. canceled. It was officially canceled, but what is it ever officially announced is my question. Sort of. Was it? Unofficially, when? officially? When was it officially I announced? I don't actually know. I feel like it was always as part of, whenever we talked about The Last of Us, this was always just part of the conversation. Yeah, people so can leave, I don't know. People can leave a comment and correct us, but I feel like they kind of teased it at Summer Game Fest Yes. A, a couple times ago. There was ago. like a trailer for it. Did they, ha- did they have a trailer for I that? I think they did have a trailer during Summer Game Fest for okay. it. Okay. But it didn't, maybe they didn't announce like any specifics around like okay. dates or time. Because I've always found that interesting of like people talking so definitively about this being this mm-hmm. tangible thing. And even Naughty Dog talking about it so tangibly. But I was like, did this ever get announced? I, think, I don't know. I think there was a trailer. I'm not a I big Last of Us fan. I remember a trailer. So I am, I am not the target for this. But... Uh, they have officially canceled it, mm-hmm. and they really go into a lot of detail yeah. about why, which I find very fascinating. And, you know, the, the TLDR of that is they kind of made this realization that if they wanted this to be the thing that they had envisioned it to be, mm-hmm. it would kind of consume the, the entire, entire studio. studio. Yeah. And they would have to make this decision of, do we want to do this? And support this for as long as we can, or do we want to, you know, maintain down the path of making these excellent single player games? Which is part of their like Which is what they've always done. Their heritage. Right. Yeah, exactly. This is what Naughty Dog is known for, is these like narrative driven single player games. So to go away from that I think was right. pretty tough for and, them. Yeah, and I mean this was, you know, sounds like this was pretty far along. So that has to have been a very challenging yeah, decision. Ouch. But I do think ultimately this is a smart decision. I think so too. And I do, I did have the thought of, is this an indicator of like a bigger shift within Sony? Because remember like a year or so ago, it was like, mm-hmm. hey, we've got 15 live, live service, service games. Live service games, yeah. And we were like, oh, uh, really? And <laughs> if Naughty Dog is making this decision, is this, is, is like maybe behind the scenes, is Sony corporate being like, hey, let's, let's, let's not do all of those. Let's not do all of those. Probably, I mean, there's there's a significant business risk, right? To like hang your you know hang everything on all your resources yeah. on this thing, right? So I'm kind of honestly like, again, not to be like a hater because I'm not a super Last of Us fan, but I'm kind of glad that they made this they swung this way because I want other Naughty Dog narrative driven single player games. Like I do, I love those games. And I want them to focus on that. So I'm kind of glad this is happening. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, Sony has Destiny, which is, you know, the live service game leader. And they're yeah, having, and they're a, having a, so awful, many issues with that. an awful time and an yeah. awful year trying to make sense of that. So I do think this is really smart. I think yeah. this is like a near miss for them. Oh, of my. Like, look at how close we came to 
perhaps making this huge mistake. And what if something happens and the studio shuts down because of it? Right. Like that could have been a very real right. possibility. Right. So yeah. just just fascinating to get this glimpse into. You know, people are not normally this forthcoming about this. I'm glad that they were though, and it, it makes it. Yeah. I'm sure people that were looking forward to this, like they can at least understand the other side of the perspective yeah. there. Yeah. That's the news. Let's get into some questions from our community. Every question we get is from our Patreon community. Our first today is from Cerulean Dragon. Hey, you two. A common critique I've seen of the Game Awards this year is how so little time was spent on the winners being able to speak after winning their awards and if they were able to speak at all and weren't just uh, quickly cycled through. At the same time, I understand that the Game Awards depend on virality and engagement to secure funding so the show can even happen, and I know that without announcements and celebrities, that number could drop off quickly. So my question is, why do you both watch the Game Awards for the winners or for the reveals? How do you think the Game Awards could be better balanced between acceptance speeches and reveals? And finally, do you think the two should be separated into a Winter Game Fest and the awards ceremony itself? Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, I think um, when we first started watching, well, it was a little bit different because when we were first doing the Game Awards, we were like working on the Game Awards. So we were balancing, you know, award acceptance speeches and what that might look like along with announcements. But I think now that I'm just like a viewer of the Game Awards, I really see it as two things. One is like, the end of the end of the year celebration for like this year of games. Like we had a great year of games. It is a good to take a moment for all of us together to celebrate all the great games that we loved, and and of course the developers that made these games. And so, if if that celebration is in the in the shape and form of accept, acceptance speeches, then yeah, I think that is one of the reasons why I watch. But the Game Awards has always been about reveals. And announcements. So I, I do watch also in anticipation of people using this like huge platform to reveal stuff. But yeah, I agree. The balance was a little bit off this year. I do think that there was like less true reveals and more so like paid sponsored trailers, um, which was a little disappointing. But um, yeah, I hope that the balance will be a little bit better next year. There are a lot of awards events in the industry and people don't really care about those and they don't pay attention to those there's you know the dice awards the mm -hmm. gdc awards others yeah. maybe it's because they happen deeper into the following year and people have just moved on but this right. this is like kind of like the oscars equivalent where it's like this is the one the like best, pic best picture yeah like there's other movie event there's other movie awards people mm -hmm. don't really care about those so th somehow this has has gain that position of the one that, that people should care about. Right. And that's significant. So I don't think we can downplay the award side because people do care. Like yeah. people have, like when he does that stream and reveals the nominations, like that's a big day for people talking about games and paying mm -hmm. attention to games because people want to know. Yeah, and then when you win a game, a TG, and when you win a game award, people like list it forever. On, right. Like they're like, this is a game award winner. Or this is right, a Game like, Award nominee. And they think that, you know, this will help their sales. Yeah, like, this people is like truly put epic. it on their website, exactly. put it all over the place, put a sticker on the box. Yeah, Because yes. you won an award, it, it means something. I think as far as the speeches, I think they just had an overreaction to that one speech last year from the God of War guy. Yeah. And they kind of freaked out. And they're like, we need, well, we got we to gotta stop this. Right. It was one speech. I know. That went kind of long. Like, yeah. Did anybody tune out then? Maybe maybe they had some data that people just tuned out then. That's like ridiculous. I don't think they, I don't think they it was did like the though. First speech. If people can sit through like a three hour commercial for some random Korean mobile game, <laughs> they can sit through a speech yeah. for a game that they actually know about. That's true. It's like a minute. So I think they just need to let it to cool it with that and let people yeah. say what they want to say. Every yeah. now and then you'll get one oddball that, that goes too long. And that's just what it is, you know? Every and That's just what right. happens in a live show. But, but thinking like, oh, the, the views are going to tank if we let the guy in the suit of armor talk for 31 seconds after he won game of the year. It's like, what? Or like what the are you... people that are like, you know, like that speech especially because he was talking about like people that had passed away. And people were like, and like his other co they're like crying in the audience. And you're yeah. like, 20 seconds. Like, I don't know. that's very I don't insensitive. Know. I don't like, know. 
That's just not very. I mean, yeah. that's not a good. The that's show is the show is basically four hours long. We're all in it for the long haul. We want to see what happens. The big reveal at the end is <laughs> let the people talk. Yeah, but but is there if there is a way? Oh my gosh, seriously! Like I know that we need to like give him leeway here because he needs to like fund the show. But some of those, there was like it was like someone did that breakdown, right? It was like an hour and thirty five minutes of just commercials. There's got to be a way to find two and a half minutes for my live down by the river performance. Oh, I want so it. Bitter I'm still about mad it. about still that. Bitter. Okay. I deserve that. I deserve it. I deserve it. Me. You personally Me. deserve this. I deserve that. <laughs> down by the river. Garteeth is next. Hi, Kit and Krista. The recent report for the U.S. video game market by Circana showed console hardware. Console hardware for the industry declined by 24% this November uh -oh. compared to the same period last year, November 2022, with double-digit declines experienced for all three consoles. When I look at 2024's games lineup, I am left to wonder if rough times are ahead for the industry next year, too. Going into 2023, there were a slate of potential sales juggernauts we could look towards like Zelda, Hogwarts, Diablo, Starfield, and Spider-Man. But there aren't many games announced for 2024 that I think carry that same anticipation. What are your thoughts on the state of the console gaming market this holiday? And how do you feel about the direction the market is headed in 2024? Do you think there are still potentially big games coming next year? Or do you think it will be a quieter year in preparation for 2025? And then Gartooth has the receipts with the charts if the you receipts. would like to take a look. Yeah. So let's go, let's go one by one here. So Nintendo is at the end of a life cycle. Yep. They did their darndest to make it a good one. They did well. And, and I think they did. Success. I think, I think they juiced as much as they could, but there's just not much left. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that's a main factor. I think there's a recognition that we are coming towards the end of yeah. something, and we're not sure about the next thing. Right. Right? We don't know yet. But I think... I mean, there's a lot of in indicators. It, 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 even if you just look at these numbers about the declines, yeah. that next year would be a good year to do that. Right. And that that alone will be a big boost to the industry. Exactly. Anytime you're launching new original hardware, that's yeah. a huge boost. And that's going to come with, hopefully... All of the big franchises. I, I was going to say a big, you know, software lineup with big franchises. Right. Yeah. Microsoft has felt like we're on, like, year four of trying to get this thing off the ground. They finally got it, though. Sort of. Well, the acquisitions, kind of. all that stuff. Again, Microsoft has been like cooking quietly, simmering, in like the. This is what I believe for four years. For four years, this is a this is like a crock pot <laughs> chili that we've been making for four years, and I just feel like they are poised perfectly now to do a thing next year. Yeah, they they are coming out of this year with a bit of momentum. Yes, they're gonna be all right. It's just I don't know what happened to their first party output. Yeah. Where it kind of just like doesn't exist anymore. It's gonna be okay. And but they have said like our goal is a big first party launch every, every quarter. quarter. Yeah. So I think now is the time to really hold them to that. It's yes. like you are out of excuses. That's right. You own fifty percent of these studios in the industry. Like get it, get it going. You've had time to make these games. Where are they? They have they have them. I I have faith. I have faith. All right. I think that they are just. They've been waiting for everything to be like sign on the dotted, like ink needs to dry kind of thing. Uh, well, that's that's Activision only. Yeah, but, but what I about mean, everybody else? They, they they're po they're trying to poise themselves for this this like very consistent run next year. I really think this is gonna happen. I need I need to Microsoft, see it. Microsoft, please don't disappoint me. I need to see it this I'm year. I'm wearing your t-shirt right now. Like I'm wearing the t-shirt, not under this, but I need to see it. This I year. need this to happen. And then this year, I mean next year. I need this to happen. Sony is the one where I, I did think they might have had a bit of a bigger year than they actually did, and I don't know exactly what happened. They had some expensive, as usual, things that maybe didn't pay off as much. Well, that, I mean, this is just sales, so mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, profits or anything. I do think it hurts that they only release, like, one to two big first-party games. Yeah. A year. A year. Because they're so big and expensive right, so that, and like long development cycles. Yeah, that's just kind of how they've positioned themselves now. Yeah. And maybe that is hindering the rapid growth of hardware. Because I, I did think that, you know, now that there's no more supply constraints, we got the slim, I did think it would be a bit more explosive. Yeah. Maybe than it, it has been. We need to see what the, the holiday sales are going to be. But up to this point... 
it hasn't yeah. been quite as big. They've been stable, but it hasn't right. jumped like we thought. Right, it would. right, yeah, right. And I do wonder how they think about something like a PS5 Pro. Of you know, when do we need to play that card to juice this mm -hmm. a little bit? Might be next year. It it could potentially be next year. Next year to combat Switch. Yeah, that's too. the one that's a bit enigma enigmatic for me because it feels like it should be bigger. PS5 feels like it should. I mean, it's it's just, it's selling fine. Again, like stable at, but not explosive. When you look at the comparisons against the other Sony hardware, yeah. it's doing great, but it feels like it has more potential. I'd be a, I'd be a little bit puzzled if I was Mr. Big Shot at Sony about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Greg Vogt asks, one of the biggest differentiating features with Xbox and PlayStation versus Nintendo, I feel, is the former's use of analog triggers for their consoles, while Nintendo sticks with digital triggers for every console since the GameCube, which did have analog triggers. Why did Nintendo switch to digital triggers, and could we see a return to analog ones for a future console? I have no idea. Did you know, I, you're going to answer this question for me right now as I ask you this question, did you know that there was a difference in the triggers between the two? There's the answer. Nobody knows. It's, I did not. I was reading yes. this question. Like, I don't know what, what is an analog? What is a digital? I that, don't get it. That is the answer right there. People don't know. It's too. Do you know? Well, I mean, PlayStation definitely does because there's games like that Astro's Playroom where you really are like carefully oh. like dialing it in. Okay. Versus like Nintendo, it's like you push it, it's a press. There's only one press. Okay. Yes, it's oh. like yes or no, are you pressing this? I see. Versus there's like gradations of how hard you're pressing it. And the GameCube had those triggers that were very Yeah. that had yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. of lot of motion to so them. So which one do I like? Digital. Analog. Digital. I like the PlayStation. But I think that's the reason. I think Nintendo knows this is just over people's heads. So they're like, why would, why would we bother with this? I see. I did not know. We made this great HD rumble where people can roll an ice ice cube around and everybody just goes, bang. That's like, that's their implementation of HD yeah. rumble. Why waste our time? Yeah. We had a great conversation in our Discord about how the PlayStation 2 controller had pressure sensitive face buttons. That's true. That was crazy. And there were like 15 games that used it, period. Yeah. And even, even in our Discord, how knowledgeable we are in that Discord, yeah. so people are like, like what? What? <laughs> what? Yeah. So, Some of the control stuff is like over. So you can heads. have features that are just people just don't know about or mm -hmm. can, don't take note of because they're yeah. so like it's just so minute. It's just a little obscure. Yeah. Correct. Uh, but I do. I do. Again, I really love that dual sense and whatever triggers love they that have. Dual sense. I like that. So do that for. <laughs> okay. Other, there's the answer. Consoles. Do a dual sense with a bigger battery, please. I'm, I've solved my problem. Ninja11 asks, we all know Nintendo has not been the greatest when it comes to accessibility in their games, but one of the new specials in Splatoon takes it a bit too far. The splatter color screen causes players eye pain, oh my nausea, gosh. makes playing more difficult for colorblind oh players, no. even though the game has colorblind settings. There are so many accounts of players with various visual and audio disabilities being hurt by this special. Do you think Nintendo will listen to the community and patch the special? There are ways to make the special serve its intended disruptive purpose without being painful. Communities are considering banning it, and there has never been anything banned from Splatoon. Oh my gosh! I did wow. not realize this was happening. That's terrible. Nintendo is really not the best when it comes to accessibility. It's such an afterthought for them, you know, um, which is really unfortunate. And whenever we would try to like bring it up to people, they would be like, "Why?" They weren't very interested. In they were not interested talking about it even. But. Yeah, it sounds like this one is pretty significant, though, if it's causing, like, such a, you know, negative effect for players. Um, yeah, I hope that... I mean, Splatoon is pretty big in Japan, and if that's also happening within the Japanese market, that's a better shot, too, for them to care. So hopefully that is something that they're looking into. Yeah, I do think this will get addressed. There, there are good me mechanisms inside Nintendo for these things to get flagged as issues, yeah. whether it's from customer service mm -hmm. or from things people are saying on social media or in like traditional media. These things get elevated yeah. and they do make their way to the developers. And in this case, like the stories are so severe, I don't think they really have a choice. Right, exactly. This seems to be pretty significant, so hopefully it gets addressed yeah. very soon. Riven asks, Super Mario World, The Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, Super Metroid, these three games are legendary staples of gaming oh. canon. Arguably, they are perfect video games, but I'm not questioning that. My question, therefore, is this. How would you feel about remakes or remasters of these games? 
What changes could you see being made, if any, besides a graphical and sound overhaul? What art style would you like to see? Are there any other games you might say should never be remade, not because they are bad, but because they are already perfect as is? Wow. Some of these games, like Super Mario World, just still hold up so well without the need for a remaster. You know what I mean? So, like a game like that, I don't feel like you have to, because you could just play the original and it's still good and it still yeah. holds up really well. Yeah, you can ask yourself, like, what are the reasons you would want to do a remaster? Mm -hmm. Graphics. Uh, the graphics have aged badly. This the... tends to be like sometimes eight bit games or right. like PS One, right? Pre HD three D games yeah. often need this. Um, the gameplay controls are controls are, need to be are just feel weird. With modern controls, yeah, right? Uh, I don't think in this case. I don't think either of these games are in a need of being remade. Exactly. So yeah. I, I think let them be. Yeah, you might mess it up if you remake yeah. it. I honestly, mean, there's something about the SNES graphics is they're just detailed enough that they right. still hold up. Although I do like the graphic update for Super Mario RPG because those. Bosses well, are really ugly. You could say that, that that graphical style did not hold up. That's true. The kind of Donkey Kong Country super, super early CG yeah, that's shrunk what it down was. onto a Super NES. That's what it was. That very, graphical style is not the yeah, graphical style, like say, this is of, pixel art. of Mario, uh, Super Mario World. Right. Um, the music is still very strong and evocative. Mm -hmm. does not feel old no. or, or tinny or anything like that. The, the controls still feel great. Yeah, so, the controls are perfect. Yeah, I think you would be opening a real can of worms if you said we need to remake these. Yeah. So it's a good cautionary tale that not everything needs it. Right, right. Yeah. Last question is from Trexius86. Do you think Nintendo is looking at how other companies are pulled away from X, formerly known as Twitter? Oh, boy as a platform to post updates and announcements and are considering doing so themselves. How did Nintendo view Twitter as part of their strategy and marketing communications? I will just point out that as the latest Twitter meltdown was happening and as what's his name was saying crazy things on that stage, yes. two huge pieces of gaming news were shared basically exclusively through Twitter. Right. The Mario movie announcement yep. was made on Twitter and the news about the coming Grand Theft Auto trailer was made on Twitter. So you can say that platform's a mess, that platform is falling apart. But at the same time, anybody. at the same time, it ain't stopping the news. It's just people are too addicted and it's too big. Twitter is X, whatever, is Nintendo's what highest subscriber base, right? High is yeah, it, that's that what, like, still on I, think, yeah, I think it's about 13 million. Yeah, 13 million. Yeah. YouTube is like nine and a quarter. Yeah, they're almost to the diamond button, but. Well, it slowed down when we left. <laughs> Give me the diamond <laughs> slowed button. Slowed down. Let me get it. You just send it, it straight here. Yes. Send, send it straight to me. Thank you. I mean, um, there, there's just no alternative yet that has caught on. Like, there yeah. have been these moments where everybody's like, oh, we're going to Blue Sky, we're going to Threads, we're going to whatever. Yeah. None of those, for whatever reason, has caught on where there's this critical mass of people. Mm -hmm. Like, you would think, like, Threads now is at a point where it actually has those basic features that Threads it should have had. Threads sucks. You are very anti-Threads. I'm very anti-Threads. Like, that one feels like if they had launched it with those basic features But they then, didn't. They didn't. They made some fatal they errors. They made some really bad errors. They made some bad decisions. And then they, they totally wasted their opportunity of And then like, they were way too slow. And then they were so slow. Yeah. It's, so, it's so like Facebook, honestly. Right. Oh my gosh. Or meta. Or so. Um, the other thing, too, about Twitter is like there's always that discourse around like, oh my gosh, all the big advertisers are leaving. This right. Elon is, is gone crazy again and, and just telling his advertisers to go away and being really ridiculous. But then that happens for a couple of weeks and then the advertisers come right back because they know that it's where people are still. Yeah. So like Netflix is back on there. Yeah. I mean, one thing that so Nintendo like is great at is waiting out bad news. Yeah. So They're not a knee-jerk company. Right. And so they'll just ride it out. I mean, they, they're they very lucky, obviously. I mean, they are Nintendo, so there's lots of platforms that they are on. 
that have large followings as well. So it's not like if Twitter goes away, like, oh no, there's no other place for them to share news. But Twitter is a huge part of their marketing communication strategy and it is the biggest channel that they have. So I don't see them getting away from it anytime soon and they're definitely gonna continue to take that wait and see approach. Yeah, and I'm sure they're looking closely at, you know, is our engagement slipping? Is yeah, our growth slipping? Like now that this is, you know, this platform is different, um, they're, they're not going to get caught up in the more kind of sensationalist things that are happening yeah, around it. They're going to exactly. look at it very plainly of like, this is, this is a tool for us. Is it still serving the intended need? If so, mm -hmm. we will continue to use it. I have seen that they have not launched new Twitter accounts recently. And they used to be like real it's gun ho. It's impossible now. About, remember they used to do, no, Japan used to love. Oh, Japan you mean. I see. Like they used to love, um, doing like an account for every game, like Fire Emblem right. Heroes needs one and blah, blah, blah needs right. one. And we always try to tell them like not to do that. But um, but, they, did, I, but I, is it that or do they already have all the accounts they, they need might, they for might, the franchise? It might just be, yeah, exactly. Right, right, it might be, right. it might be, have, have already been done. Yeah, for us, there just became too much red tape of, of doing anything. So yes, we just new, stopped asking. New accounts were just like, you, know, you just can't, <gasps> do, you just can't last, do it. The last one was like the versus, right? And then the, that was Even it. that one had controversy. Very, a around, lot. Around it. Very, yeah. a lot. Very, a lot. True. <laughs> So yeah, very a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. Whoo! Wow. This is a this is a giganto episode. I know. I was like, are we gonna be like <laughs> slowing down? You always say that. We never are. This is like end of the year. It's we a whopper. Just chill and hang out. We could do. I mean, it was great, but um, yeah, lots of cool stuff. We are going to now shout out our beautiful superstars. Are you ready? Yes. Aaron Hash. Ben Icorn. Maro Mayhem. Eigenverse. Kiss My Flapjack. Mike Chin. Roy Eschke. Switching it up. Underscore. phase on. VGM Life. Link, the hero of Winds. Angela Bycroft and her pig Molly. Thomas O'Rourke. Kyle LaBeouf. Roberto Nieves. Frederick Ulf Conradson. Andrew Uhas. Chili. Bruce Dash. And Rain Tech. Oh boy, that's very exciting. Okay, here we go with our one-up club graduation ceremony. A. Ron Burgundy. Ale Alejandro. Astro Dev. Awesome 46. Bad Moon Horizon. Benji B. Blue Yellow Gray. Bookum Dano. Bookishly Fab. Brooke Obscura. Brovac Novak. Cameron. Chelly Squirrel. Christopher Lay. Captain Alex. Crim Cat. C. Roper 17. Cynical Squid. Dachshund. Doinko. Dolce. Dino Punch. Elite Peach. Espar's 50. Fart Pre 69. Fairbound. Fernie and Jess Forever. Fox Deploy. Garrett Hullfish. Garth the Wolf. Gartooth. G Sun 101. Heroic. Iris Marin. Jay Rando. Jabroni Jones. Jeffrey Hernandez. Jerry 92602. Jesse Hernandez. John Responte. Jonathan Rowe. Jordan Collette. Jordan Hemmerly. Juji Fruit. Jess Camtro. Justin Leminger. Kawa 2796. Keith Kwan. Kevin Delane. Kilo Kibo. Krista Roddy Kid. Christopia Party with me. Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie. Kyle Kretzer. Kyle, oh, Lanelle Stickman. Lazy Cat for Coffee. Lex. Lit. Macho Potato. Mad Dog 5981. Magnificent Easy G Callie Murray. Marky Man 64. Mario Man 392. Mecha Dragon 101. Medallion 2889. Megan. Michael Cravens. Mikey. Motomania. Mr. Andy Pong. Mr. Beans and Dip. MSN Poke Gamer. My Tran. Nasir. Nathan Burkhart. Nick. Ninja Eleven. Panda Buns. Pangy. Palsy Pace. Paul Gale Network. Prime Factor. Prince Charmless. Reaver. Riot One. Rob Osborne. Rocks. Rianetta. Sharif Jackson. Sheer Cold Vanilla. Shinryu. Slowbro. Schnozzle. Spicy Munchkin. Steel's Throne. Tales of Link. Tech Magic. The Shark Among Men. Thomas Alvarez. Three Rivers. Tim Vacanti. Topher Schmofer. Travis Torline. Trajawi. Tugs Puppy Bear. Tusku. Tyler Geis. Vest Fest. Video Game Stupid. Viridian. Virtual Bot. Weeb Kingdom. WG Grizzy. What of Khalil? Wicked Davy. Will Johnson. Zudiver. Zelgra. Zapati. Zroid. Wow. Good job. Um, if you like to support us, we are at patreon.com slash kit and Krista. Get all the good stuff. Yeah. There. If you're watching us on video on YouTube, you can go ahead and subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and also leave us a comment. And if you are one of our great audio listeners, you can also subscribe, uh, give us a five-star rating, and leave a written review, if you please. 
And we are on the socials. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and yes, we are still on Threads. Really sold, sold the Threads uh, follows there. Our Thread. Way to sell our, it. Our brand Thread is quite good, run by I'm you. I'm toiling on these run channels. Run by you. My personal Thread is left up to you. <laughs> Don't Kevin. follow her, Don't follow, follow us. Me. Don't follow me, follow Kit and Krista. Um, okay, that is all. We will be back next week. True. Um, but until then, we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.